Who are these people? I'm talking about the academics that seemingly spring from nowhere to become famous authors. Their books become legends. Their books are made into films, TV shows and plays. Their books are used in schools where children are told this is what real literary talent is. Their books change cultures, they change attitudes over generations, even centuries. In this series we have discussed many people who are linked in some way to the Huxleys. None more so than Eric Blair, aka George Orwell. When we say the phrase, we live in Orwellian times, we all know the connotations of what that means. Orwell's work has influenced lives generation after generation. Social engineering at its best. A question we ask is, did he actually exist? Was he a figment of the imagination? Set out by the security agencies. George Orwell, an enigma. Why was he, or what was written in his name, so important that it is still used today? Also, his books, Animal Farm and 1984, like Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, sum up what we're living through now, exactly. When I look into these people, you can clearly see that it is a setup, a scam, a sleight of hand. To put it simply, Blair, stroke Orwell, his undercover name, was a security asset, even if it did exist. These people are placed in magazines that are fronts themselves for MI6 and CIA setups to give their work a semblance of credibility. These people go to the right schools. They are the 1% of the 1% of the 100%. But they all share things in common. In these individuals or families, we can see the threads of the matrix via the bloodlines. We see the outlines of a blurry picture materializing. The faceless parasitical matrix uses these individuals and their skill sets as weapons that have been set against us all. Whether these people know it or not, maybe they're being used either unknowingly or against their wishes, it makes no difference. They are part of or working for the dark side. These individuals plant seeds or future spells to come true in the minds of the sleeping NPCs. You're listening to Sheep Farm's Huxley's Brave New World Order series. This is episode four and will be in two parts, so it'll take up episodes four and five. As always, all the information comes from mainstream sources. I'd like to thank Lorraine for her help and my wife for putting up with my endless hours of research. Just who are these flockers? As we all know, the biological and social stimulation of the family leads to private reflection outside party needs. You 
Unorthodox loyalties which can only lead to thought crime. Alright, welcome back. This is episode four of Sheep Farm Meet the Flockers series of Huxley's Brave New World Order. This was only going to be about 30 minutes of episode three, but now we're on episode four, and this is probably going to be two episodes in itself. Uh, we're going to be talking about Eric Blair, aka George Orwell. And as I said, these presentations will be in two parts. Orwell is a bit of an enigma, and uh, this presentation is going to be called or the part one is going to be called Mockingbirds. As we saw in episode three, The Doors of Perception, nothing is what it seems, and everything is controlled, or at least the attempt is made to try and control everything. George Orwell, seemingly from a lower, upper, middle-class stock, which is how they've expla uh, uh, explained him, which seems a bit strange, is portrayed, portrayed as anti-establishment, anti-totalitarian, and for the rights of the working-class people. I would say he's more or less the entire opposite, but anyway. He was anti-communist, anti-fascist, and pro-freedom, but nothing could be further from the truth. He worked for the intelligence services, and he had the right bloodlines, as we'll see in episode two. We'll see partly in this episode as well. Sorry, in, in episode five. Orwell wrote about the barn wall in Animal Farm and was part of the writing of the barn wall in reality. That's why we've called this episode Mockingbirds. And it's dedicated to George Orwell. Although it's not all about George Orwell, there will be some crossovers as well. Whilst writing and researching this Huxley's Brave New World Order series, it dawned on me what the Matrix is, is doing. For years we've talked about predictive programming and the revelation of method and these evildoers needing to tell us what they're going to do in advance for some kind of karmic recourse. Well, here it is. How do individuals like Huxley, Orwell and H.G. Wells, and people like that, know what's going to happen years in advance. The planning is done decades, generations, even centuries ahead of time, before these people are even born. It's virtually impossible to have a crystal ball to t and write down what you think is going to happen. But these individuals seem to be able to predict the future like savants. They write books about it, and kids are told about it in schools around the world, and then it happens, just like that. But how do they know or get this knowledge? Are they geniuses? Is it passed to them by secret dark occult groups or given to them by frequency technologies? The truth is, though, that their fiction has a habit of coming true. And we plebs have a bad habit of 
equating riches and material gain to success. This just isn't true. Yes, most of these people are of a certain class, but a lot of them are not the multi-billionaires that we think are the success stories. They have cult-level devotion as well to the cause, and they do have the right bloodlines running through them. That's no doubt. We always see that. And this goes above religion. You know, a lot of people blame a certain religion for everything, namely the Jewish people. And I don't buy that one. After doing this research, I don't buy that it's all about that priest class. I don't think that at all. And I'm sure our Chris uh, agrees with me. I think we, when we look at this bloodline, there is all of these people are involved in it for some reason. It is like the Prometheus bloodline. Success seems to be measured by cultural and genetic changes in the population, just as much as financial gain and control. Before we start, I'd like to thank my friend and fellow researcher Lorraine for helping me with some of the finer details of this research, because some of it came out of nowhere. And I want to make it clear that this episode and the next episode will probably not contain every bit of information about George Orwell or evidence linked to Orwell, but what it will show is show blatantly is that Orwell was an obvious agent of the state. All information is taken from the mainstream and we make no wild claims. It's up to you to make your own conclusions. We just follow the evidence, evidence trail left by the matrix by looking back in time. So, Chris, welcome. Thoughts on anything you took out of that intro? Um, <clears throat> well, I've always been a fan of George Orwell. I mean, even before I went down the conspiratorial rabbit hole, if you like, <clears throat> and I've read I've read most of his st stuff. I've read 1984 a number of times, and even more recently, um, An Animal Farm. Um, but I also read his um, Wigan Pier one, where he was down the pit. I didn't read all that, actually, I'm telling a lie there. But I did read the Down and Out in Paris and London, right. which I quite enjoyed, because it's <clears throat> being a chef, it was, uh, it was about him working in kitchens at some point, which I, I found interesting anyway. But something that's always bothered me about Orwell is there's only one or two photos of him. And like you said, there's no um, audio or video of him. Because we looked we looked some years ago, actually. I think even yeah. before previous nonsense, I remember me and talking about it. Because I think yes. we found one film, didn't we? But it, wasn't, it was an act, act, acted film uh, yeah. doing his life story. Yeah, well, that actor, I forget his name now, but we'll talk about him in a bit. Yeah. Well, further on in this, I think this uh, episode. But, but we talked about some time ago whether he actually even exists. Um, yeah. Because, like I said, there's only a couple of photos, and not. And from what we've talked about more recently, while you've been doing this research, is um, <clears throat> he seems, he, he seems like a character who's been made up, or mm. or he's been put into certain positions so he can be the guy who writes 1984, the Mockingbird. Mm. Yeah, very interesting though. Um, it's almost like they tried to make him out to be working class, mm. um, you know, joining these certain groups and stuff. Um, fighting for the working class kind of thing but uh, as always i mean it can't it can't be a coincidence that his two his two books are in all the schools yeah. and kids are told to read them students are told to read them like the brave new world yeah. why why are some of these books lauded up to be these you know strokes of genius yeah i mean we, we read I, I know it's somewhat slightly different we read Roald dahl's as well um all these people that we were reading and as we're seeing, like the music industry that the guys have researched, Mark Devlin, yeah. uh, Mike Williams, uh, Dave McGowan, etc., cetera, Crow 777, they're all links back to some kind of military <clears throat> or military intelligence, as we showed with the Dawes episode. And, like, and this is the same, Roald Dahl were intelligent. Well, also, like, like anything, you're told what to read, aren't you? You're told yes. what music to like. You're told what films are the best films, you know, and they cover every angle, don't they? Um, and like, like I said before, if it's in Watson's as you walk in, it's there for a reason, isn't it? You yeah, know? yeah. But go, going back to, and we are going to hit on this bit that there are no, and it's no, no known audio recordings or film of George Orwell, and we're going to call him George Orwell all through way through this, not uh, Eric mm. Blair. Um, bear in mind he worked for the BBC for two years during the war and 
talking about propaganda and he was w w working um, for the BBC delivering this propaganda. The pictures that are shown of him, I have to say there's a couple of, there's a few pictures out there and some of them look slightly like the different person in my opinion, but I'm not an expert on images, but they do look a, a little bit different. And I, I just find, I just find it hard to believe that he's got a pic. There's a, there's a famous picture of him with a, one of those old microphones. Uh, and I'll put it up now while we, while if you're watching this, not listening to it on the uh, podcast um, of him with a BBC microphone. Yeah. I've seen that. Yeah. And th why haven't they recorded that? I don't, I, I personally, I think that's a bit of a setup, but why, 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 why wouldn't they record that? There's, um, yeah, th th there's no reason, reason not to. And, uh, I can't believe that one of the most famous authors in time, there's no recordings of him. Aldous Huxley's the same. There's only a few recordings of Aldous Huxley. There is more than, obviously, than uh, than that, Orwell. There's that famous one, isn't there, where he does that big long speech? Yes, yeah, at the university, one of the university, mm. and there's one at the beginning of the first episode that we did where he's interviewed and it's all black and white and weird and they're all the, 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 the smoking while they're talking and all that type of stuff. Mm. Uh, but, yeah, and... There's no way we could cover every area of his work, but hopefully we'll cover enough in these two presentations for you to get a picture of who he actually was. And did he exist? Mm. Well, I'm sure, I, I kind of think he did, but yeah. it's just we've been given a version of that story. That's what I would guess at, but I don't know. Yeah. Um, but how did he go? How did he go about writing a book in 1948 <clears throat> about TV screens watching you, which uh -huh. is well, what we're doing right now, I suppose, yeah. Yeah. you know. Um, but unlike his version of events, we're actually paying for it rather than it being forced upon us. Well, again, like like I said in that intro, it's strange how these people are telling us what's going to happen. Um, and it happens 54, whatever, 75 years ahead, ahead doesn't mm. it? Um, and... Uh, yeah, it's uh, a strange phenomenon. Anyway, we'll move on. So I want to start Operation Mockingbird. I've called this Mockingbird, and, and the re reason is obvious. Operation Mockingbird recruited leading American journalists into propaganda networks and influenced the operations of front groups. CIA support of front groups was exposed when an April 1967 Ramparts article reported that the National Student Association received funding from the CIA. Shock and horror. In 1973, a document referred to as The Family Jewels was published by the CIA containing a reference to Project Mockingbird, which was the name of an operation in 1963 wiretapping two journalists believed to be disseminating classified information. Deborah Davis wrote in her book Catherine the Great, 1979, an unauthorised biography of Catherine Graham, owner of the Washington Post, that the CIA ran an Operation Mockingbird during this time, writing that the Prague-based International Organisation of Journalists, the IOJ, received money from Moscow and controlled reporters on every major newspaper in Europe. Disseminating stories that promoted the communist cause, and that Frank Weisner, director of the Office of Policy Coordination, had created Operation Mockingbird in response. Tom O'Neill's book about the Manson murders has shown that there was operations running to recruit members of the arts, academics, entertainment and business, etc., to help control whatever narrative was required for the time. I don't think that can be really argued against now, can it? Well, it can be, but I think it'd be foolish to argue against it, wouldn't it, Chris? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, the the old Manson nonsense was just... As I think I mentioned before, I remember seeing um, some in, in the headier days of YouTube, <laughs> some video of uh, when they raided that um, his ranch, you know, the Manson ranch, and all the it, cops were dressed in, like, stage, Hollywood stage outfits. Yeah. Um, someone were pointing out, and they, they all had different. None of the outfits matched with what, with what what was going on and where they were. They were in in the wrong places. Yeah, well, when you see Tom O'Neill talk about that, and when you read it in his book about how they actually 
they arrested him and just let him go. They said they didn't have anything on him. So they had helicopters flying <clears> over. <throat> I forget how many uh, coppers were floating around. And you said that you said there were choppers flying all over Hollywood at that time for mm. weeks and weeks. Everyone mm. was terrified. And who is it? Uh, Steve McQueen was. They're all carrying, carrying revolvers <laughs> on the hip and stuff because they right. were next. They thought yeah. they were next. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the same fear bullshit as we've seen numerous times since, I suppose. Yeah. I mean, I mean, and Orwell. Um, if the per, if if the character exists, it might have been again George Orwell might have been like. James Bond, for argument's sake, several mm. different characters playing um, the character. Well, imagine how easy it'd have been to hide that if you had numerous people playing him, or if he didn't exist, or whatever. Imagine how easy it'd be to hide in 1948. Yeah, especially since there's hardly any. Um, they can do it now. Pictures, audio, video of him. Um, there's the Orwell Society, though, Chris, and the Orwell right. Foundation, <laughs> um, selling selling the dream um, as usual. Orwell Foundation. I think there's the Orwell, something like the Orwell Foundation or something like that. There's a few charities floating around that's run by his, and I'll come on to them uh, uh, later on, run by his son, who it, Orwell and his wife, first wife, Eileen O'Shaughnessy Blair, um, adopted. Right. All oh, right, they adopted a son, didn't they? Yeah. Richard, who I think he would call. And Orwell was either a controlled entity either with or without his knowledge, or he willingly worked for intelligence services. My money's on the latter because of the people that were around him. Like Tony Blair, who I can't believe escaped all those pedos at them two schools. I can't believe he escaped all these intelligence agents who were around him at the time. What do you think, knowingly or unknowingly? Knowingly. Knowingly. If... George Orwell, the person, um, that's my view. I'm not saying I'm right. I'm yeah. just saying that there were too many intelligence agents around for, I mean, 1980, let me get this right. Animal Farm, they sold the rights to the CIA. Right. But, uh, of Animal Farm to make the animated film. So the CIA made the film? The CIA made the film. They funded the film. Bloody hell. Right. Um, 1984, the Information Research Department, or some promotion, for, I think. So, so what I'm trying to say is that it sounds just, like an Orwellian company. Well, it, it, there was anyway. There's involvement with these clandestine um, intelligence agencies right. to push his work after he died. Because mm. he died quite young. He was in his forties, wasn't he? Yeah. Well, he died in 1950. So and a few people died. Yeah, well, his, his, his wife died quite suddenly. Um, first wife. And he died suddenly. And another guy who will come on to, um, who was with him when he went to the Spanish Civil War. Yeah. A Belgian guy. I think he was Belgian. Um, he, he died quite suddenly as well. There were a lot of people disappearing quite suddenly. And a lot of other people that were around him, like the Cambridge Five spy ring and stuff like that, he knew all these people. One of them, one of them were his teacher. Right. At Eaton. What, who died suddenly? No, who, one of, one of the, 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 they say were the fifth member of the Cambridge Five uh, Soviet spy ring. Right, bloody hell. So I, I want to come on to Orwell's books. Um, and the reason I want to come on, I thought, I thought I'd, I'd have a look at the publishers, uh, just to see who the publishers are. Mm. And... Especially for his books, Animal Farm and 1984. Orwell is best remembered for his political commentary as a left wing anti totalitarian. I said that in the mm. um, intro. As he explained in an essay, Why I Write in 1946. It's funny, it's funny for I, I was just, <laughs> I got I, I got that geeked out with Orwell years and years ago when I first, um, mm. No, I didn't read Orwell at school because I wasn't smart enough. I was thick class. <laughs> yeah. But I read it when I left school. What was school? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I um, I got that. I bought, I've got, I've got, I've got. I think I've got all his books. I, I think there's a few I ain't got. One, one of his, I think that one where he worked in a bookshop. But I've got that one with a series of essays of why, why I write. And I was just thinking about it when you were talking. Right. I've even read that. I got that geeked out and read it all. Um, well, that's good. A lot of this stuff will come back to you as we're going through. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, I've, I've definitely read that one. I remember. I remember reading it. 
So this essay, is, is one of the lines from this essay was, every line of serious work that I've written since 1936 has been written directly or indirectly against totalitarianism and for democratic socialism, as I understood it. Hmm. So if he's a socialist in them times in the Cold War, if the Cold yeah. War were real, like we were told it was, would he, and I'll keep coming back to this point, would he really be working for um, the Information Research Department and would he be put on BBC Radio to push the military operation, well, the military might of the British Army in World War Two? No. No, not at all. Would he... Yeah, anyway. So Orwell's books uh, were published by... He had three publishers, and I'm going to I'm going to two of them here because the other one only published one of them. I think that was the American one. You might remember these, Chris, if you've read all his books. Uh, Victor Golanz, spell spell limited, spell G O double L A N C Z, was a major British book publisher publishing house of the 20th century, and continues to publish science fiction and fantasy titles as an imprint of Orion Publishing Group. So Victor Golantz, who was born in 1893, died in 1967, was a British publisher and humanitarian. Golantz was known as a supporter of left-wing policies. His loyalties shifted between li liberalism and communism. He defined himself as a Christian socialist and an internationalist. It's like a globalist, surely. Mm -hmm. A spin-off publisher set up by Golantz was the Left Book Club a publishing group that exerted a strong left-wing influence in Great Britain from 1936 to 1948. Now, if you think about that, you've got a guy here who's got a publishing company who's publishing left-wing material right under the noses, in probably in London, of, of the intelligence community. I don't think he's going to be left alone, personally, do you? Or he's there, he's there to be left alone. Yes, or he's there to be left alone. And he's knighted. Right. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> we, know, we know who he's working for. Yeah. Uh, pioneered by Victor Galanz. Sounds like that guy that invented razors, doesn't it? Uh, toothbrushes. It offered a monthly book choice for sale to members only, as well as a newsletter that required the status of a major political magazine. Victor Galanz worked for Ernest Benn Limited, founded by Sir John Williams Benn, first baronet, and father of politician William Wedgwood Ben, also known as First Viscount Stansgate. So that's Tony Ben. Right. right. Yeah. So Tony Ben was also known as Viscount Stansgate, but he was an active member of the Fabian Society and served as chairman from 1964 to 1965. The Huxleys are also married into the Wedgwood family, and the Pisas, Darwins, Arnolds and Galtons and many more. The Wedgwoods and Arnolds are also founders of the Fabian Society, as we mentioned in episode one. Hmm. So Victor Golantz and Victor Golantz Limited would have been on the Security Forces Register, registered during the Cold War, as would any of the works that they published. I will publish five books under this publisher. His first book that you mentioned, Down and Out in Paris and London in 1933, hmm. A Clergyman's Daughter, 35, Keep the Aspidistra Flying, 1936, The Road to Wigan Pier, 1937, and Coming Up for Air, 1939. Victor yeah, Glantz, what is it? No, I'm going to say, I didn't read them other ones. I think they were fiction, right. weren't they? Yeah. Right. Victor Glantz uh, was far left and probably a communist. Why would Orwell, with his anti-totalitarian views, work for this publisher? Interesting, Victor Galantz Limited also published books for David John Moore Cornwell, also known as Jean Le Carre, who in the 1950s and 60s worked for both the Security Service, MI5, and the Secret Intelligence Service, MI6. I find that a lot of these uh, book companies also published a lot of people who had worked for security, like Fleming's books and people. Yeah. Was he, was he openly... Um, MI5, MI6, John McCarthy. Well, is he admitted? I mean, I got that from his Wikipedia page. Right, there you go. Right. Yeah. 
and obviously it's said in other areas as well. And I sort of knew that myself because I've read, yeah, I've I read quite did. a few of his books. I've read a couple of his books. Um, a bit like when we looked into uh, Robert Ludlum, for argument's sake, yeah. he, he was... But it uh, also adds that edge to his books, doesn't it? Because people go, oh, you know, we're really in secret service here, and then it's mm. real, that's what happens, et cetera. Yeah. Like Ian Fleming, you know, he, he was part of MI6. So it adds that gravitas to James Bond. Don't I mean, would you say he had to get permission with some of the stuff they wrote about? Because, I mean, it was very close to... Well, I would reckon... Um, well, that's John Lecar, that is not... Yeah, uh, all yeah. Uh, except for the fact that the Cold War was just a fucking bullshit war, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, I'm sure people were killing each other. Um, mm. But, I don't, yeah, definitely. I think he was definitely pro- yeah, de- put out there to do to do what he did, John yeah. Lecaro would That's say. why they call them genres, I think, because, right, we've got to have somebody doing that. We've mm. got to have somebody do Same with music, same with TV. Mm. They've all got genres. Same with sport. What are you into football or rugby? But, it, I mean... It, you've got to have a genre. The spy, the spy novels are you know, they're quite excited. I mean, I've read a couple of... Yeah, I, like, well, I used to read them, didn't I? That yeah. stuff, yeah. So one of his other uh, publishing companies was Secker and Warburg. Uh, John Frederick Warburg and Roger Senhouse. Arville Secker, a B- British publishing company formed in 2005 from the merger of Secker and Warburg and Harville Press. Secker and Warburg was formed from a takeover of a company called Martin Secker, which was in receivership, and it was saved by Frederick Warburg and Roger Senhouse. The firm became famous or renowned for its political stance being both anti-fascist and anti-communist. So his work is signed for a pro-communist and now he's working for an anti-communist. I was going to now, say as well, Fatty, just quickly, before I forget, sorry, I should have said it earlier, but the the other one, the, 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 other, the other guy, it's funny that he had to join to get the books as well. If you joined... Yeah, membership. Yeah, but I mean that's tracing whoever joined. Yeah, sure. Well, quite possibly. Yeah, you yeah. know, maybe he did it wanted it the other way around to keep people's information secret. Well, but is it uh, early yeah. version of data collection. So, so Victor Golans. <laughs> he were he were known that they they used to they used to watch libraries for certain books to go out to um, track who dr- took out them books. Yeah, I think but, yeah. yeah, well, yeah. So I'm guessing the MI, right. MI5, MI6 did the same thing. Mm. I've no doubt if it came and, to a left And your only access was a library to get a book that you probably wouldn't be able to Again, it comes back to that Mockingbird. Where are these people stationed, these sentinels that they're, mm. they're set on? Uh, the Harville Press was founded in 1946 by Manya Harare. It'd be interesting to see if she's related to Yuval Harare. Um, and Marjorie Villiers, fourth child and youngest daughter of a Jewish financer called Grigory Benningson whose grandson, Peter Benningson, served in the intelligence corps at the Ministry of Information and worked at Bletchley Park during World War II in the testry. So he was breaking codes for the intelligence uh, services while his grandmother uh, was setting up a book com- uh, uh, company that was signing all these uh, anti-fascist and anti-communist book writers that were signing on communist book writers like George Orwell. Mm. Well, well, I mean, the, the, these early, early authors, and I mean, you, you could you could say that the the authors of these books were the um, directors, and the the book companies mm. were the producers, and the money behind these directors. What I mean is, if you compare it to modern day, where they're making films, it's yeah. propagandizers. I mean, that's what that's what they had, isn't it? They had mm. newspapers and uh, books. Yeah, that's that were their social was media, the wasn't it? Be- yeah. Before before films became a big big thing. This Peter Benningson uh, is listed as RSM Benningson in room 41 as a cryptographer and served with Donald Mickey, Susan Mickey's father, <laughs> <laughs> who worked with Alan Turing. So all these people are all interlinked. We're going to talk about Alan Turing. It was going to be in this episode, but this has gone on that long. It's going to have to be in episode six where we talk about Alan Turing because there's a link back there to... And this is, this is the link. I'll tell you the link. We're going to go into more right. detail on that ancestry. In 1952, John Frederick Warburg became a member of the Committee of the Society for Cultural Freedom, the SCF, an organisation established in the words of Warburg's friends, T.R. Favell, to promote Western culture and defend it against the communist culture of the East. Sounds like an intelligence setup to me. Mm. The SCF produced cultural magazines, Encounter, that's what it was called, which received sustained criticism in the 1960s when it 
it emerged that much of the money used to produce the magazine had come f- directly from the CIA, without the knowledge of most of its contributors and supporters, including Warburg. And that is Mockingbird in a nutshell, in it. Mm-hmm. You've got a guy who sets up his own book company, mm-hmm. is producing these books that are read by school kids, mm-hmm. and he doesn't know that the CIA is funding, funding it. it. Yeah. And, and, and when he finds out, he can't say out, can he? Mm-hmm. It's too late. Yeah, it's funny to talk about killing your heroes. I mean, I, like I said, I always liked George Orwell. Like the way he wrote, and yeah, I liked yeah. his essays. And it's a right let down this work, isn't it? <laughs> 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 I mean, thankfully, the doors weren't my heroes. So, no, but yeah, uh, yeah. I've, I've got I've got a copy of, look, even Mrs. bought me one of those, you know, those posh folio versions of 1984. I've got like three yeah. copies of it. Right. You know, one of those big... Hey, the book, like, the, the, the book, it you tells you what's it. happening. You can't knock yeah, this. Yeah. But no, again, like the, like, I mean, I'm not a Beatles fan, but like some of the Beatles music you was can't expertly deny it. written. Yeah, yeah. You can't deny I'm, it. I'm because not it Beatles was written fan. by experts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you something funny experts. about Beatles, fight. Just, just as a side note, I went to my mate Dave's house once and I, he was saying how much he loved the Beatles. His dad's a big Beatles fan. And I said, I'm, I'm not a fan. Anyway, put them on. We were sat boozing or whatever, and he put them on for a few hours just in the background. The next day, I could not get them out of my head. Yeah. I could not lose them, mm. honestly, for a day. It was just it was stuck to that twilight language. Ages. Yeah, yeah. It was stuck in my head for ages. Yeah. I could not get rid of it. And I'm not, I am not a Beatles fan whatsoever. No, I've got to say, some of the tunes obviously are catchy. I wouldn't have been. Um... Yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah. Not my bag, though. Yeah. It, the, the magazine that we were talking about that were funded by the CIA and Counter was a literary magazine founded in 1953 by poet Sir, Sir Stephen Harold Spender, CBE. After the war, Spender became a member of the Allied Control Commission, restoring civil authority in Germany. With Cyril Connolly, who we're going to come on to in a bit, uh, and Peter Watson, Spender co-founded another magazine, Horizon, that I would be mentioning, mentioning later on that published Orwell's early articles stroke essays. Spender served as its editor from 1939 to 1941. He he resigned after it emerged that the Congress for Cultural Freedom, which published it, was covertly funded by the CIA. They're all over it, aren't they? (laughs) All over it. They're all over it. Um, They're not going to leave it alone, are they? They already admitted that there were... Basically taking over all news press in the 1960s. Like I said, so. imagine how easy it was in them days. Imagine yeah. how easy it was compared to now. Yeah. We've got all those yeah. lunatics watching everything well, everyone does. What, what, there's, a, there's a theme running through this, or one of the themes running through this, is a lot of these people, because it's a bit of an artifacties, the author land, yeah, and poets and stuff like that, a lot, it seems to be a lot of these people are gay. Right. So obviously in the 40s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, um, even they've back got to the 20s. To, they've got someone to hold them. They've got leverage. Got leverage um, yeah. uh, and one of the things that comes out of this is not only is Orwell surrounded by people in the intelligence community, he's also sound, surrounded by people of importance in his life who are gay. Right. Well, like but, you said, leverage is there, isn't it? I mean, yeah. now you've got to be a bloody satanic paedophile to have any leverage. In, yeah. You know, yeah. now being... Being gay would mean nothing. You wouldn't have anything on anyone. But mm. then it was a. It was, I mean, even going back to eighties, it was still a big thing, wasn't it? Yeah. So, so you've got this guy called Spender. Um, he was a professor of English at the University College London (UCL) from nineteen seventy to seventy seven, and he worked for a magazine that was funded by the CIA. And that again is Mockingbird in full effect. You've got a guy throughout the fifties and sixties who were running probably operations or being funded underneath by the CIA. He's then now goes to retires from that magazine, that life. But he's working in a college re- recruiting students mm. to start doing the work. It's like a giant pyramid uh, selling operation, isn't it? Well, I, I remember <laughs> finding out years and years ago, being, in, you know, like in art and stuff that Pollock, Jackson Pollock was a CIA funded mm. You know, and I, I, I mean, it's devastating, isn't it? When you find people well, that you actually when I found respect that out, and like, yeah. Well, when I found that out when I was younger, I thought, what? That didn't make any sense at all. But yeah. they, were, they were creating art that's not art, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and what? But again, it comes back to that worship of mediocrity. Mm-hmm. Who better to fund, right, 
right, you can't play bass, you can't play guitar, you can't play drums, Ringo, but you're going to be famous, yeah? You're going to be worth $500 million in mm. 20, 30, 40 years' time. Just do what we say. Well, Which young at... kid at 20-year-old would argue against that? No, I wouldn't. Mm. No. I don't think anybody would. And if you think about Jackson Pollock, uh, you've got art and, you know, figured all this stuff, and he basically became famous. Well, whatever you think of him, regardless what you think of him, he was funded by CIA, apparently. Yeah. Um, and he became famous for splatting paint on a canvas. Yeah. And, you know, you can say whatever, but... I could have done that. And I'm shite well, at drawing. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but, yeah, that, I suppose that, that was one of the beginnings of modern art, wasn't it? Yeah. And you're taking away figurative drawing and skill to a, a guy who splats paint on a canvas. Mm. Regardless yeah. what you think of him. I mean, I've seen some of his paintings. They are quite striking, whatever. But he's still paint splattered on a canvas. <laughs> yeah. At the end of the I always day. remember um, just uh, our mate Dougie going to, he took Seb to uh, my son to uh, Tate Modern when he was really little. And is it, I think he's, I forget who he is now. Is it, who is it who paints in Blue Squares? Not Rothko, is it? Blue Squares. Don't, don't talk to me about artists, Sam yeah. Blue. And they're all looking at this Blue Square. Apparently, this guy, I've forgotten his name now, he uses a certain blue, etc. And Seb, being like six year old, went, <clears throat> Why is everyone staring at that blue square? <laughs> <laughs> everyone kind of shuffled off yeah. <laughs> from the yeah. mouth of babes. Yeah. Uh, Frederick Warburg, his partner. Um, and now, Warburg, where have I heard that name before? Ah, Warburg family, the German and American banking family noted for their varied accomplishments in biochemistry, botany, political activism, economics, investment banking, law, physics, classical music, art, history, pharmacology, physiology, finance, private equity, and philanthropy. Like the Warburg banking family, John Frederick, Warb Frederick John Warburg's ancestors originated from Hamburg, uh, Germany. Small world, isn't it? They all come from the same place. One of his ancestors was... Samuel Moses Frankfurter Warburg, that Frankfurt gene running thick, from Hamburg, Frankfurter from Hamburg, um, who goes back to the 1500s to a town called Warburg. And yeah, I have looked into him. I know I'm a bit sad, but there you go. <laughs> the other co-founder of Harville Secker, or Secker Warburg, was Roger Henry Pocklington Senhouse, member of the Bloomsbury Group, which is another thing we'll be talking about. Have you heard of the Bloomsbury Group? Group of like writers that were around. Well, Blue Bloomsbury is a publisher, isn't it? Yeah, but Bloomsbury Group were a group of writers, also known known as the Bloomsbury, Bloomsbury Set, right. whom Aldous Huxley was close to. The Bloomsbury Group member uh, Lytton Scratch, Stratchley, uh, Stratchy, uh, revealed that Stenhouse or Senhouse, sorry, was his last lover, and with whom, in the late twenties and early nineteen thirties, he had a sadomasochistic, masonistic sexual relationship. And again, there's a theme through this. They, I'm not having to dig <clears throat> very deep to find this information out. You know, mm. you do have to look at, follow like the trails of of these people. But you tend to find that hmm, there's an intelligence link, and they're having these types of relationships when it was illegal. I'm going to say, say to a masochism. I mean, now it's becoming basically mainstream, isn't it? I suppose. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So just to clarify, the Congress of Cultural Freedom was an anti-communist propaganda group funded on the 26th, founded, sorry, on the 26th of June, 1950 in West Berlin and was supported by the CIA and its allies. At its height, the CCF was active in 35 countries. In 1966, it was revealed that the CIA was instrumental in, in the establishment and funding of the group. There were a lot of... I'll start looking into that group, but that was another pit to go down this... Um, episode weren't about that but that it looked like the world economic forum right for artists and you know mm. that type of thing um but it also looked like the the uh what was that thing where chris witty's dad died in it the british council it's, it's that type of thing where they're trying to push a way of life onto people by throwing money at them basically the congress aimed to enlist intellectuals and opinion makers in a war of ideas against communism, just like Orwell. British author and historian Francis Stoner Sander, Saunders writes in a 1999 book, whether they liked it or not, whether they knew it or not, 
there were few writers, poets, artists, historians, scientists or critics in post-war Europe whose names were not in some way linked to this covert enterprise. The management of the CCF was entrusted to its secretariat headed by Michael Jolesson, who was a CIA agent. <laughs> <laughs> it reminds you of that, that story that when Black Panthers were at the height, that there'd be groups of groups of them and terror and groups of people and they'd all be CIA agents. And there yeah. weren't actually a real guy in there. <laughs> yeah. All in secret from each other. He recruited former communist intellectuals and Bloomsbury, Bloomsbury Group members like Bertrand Arthur William Russell, Third Earl Russell, aka Bertrand Russell. So he was a Bloomsbury Group and he was recruited um, by the CIA agent. All this is covered in this 1999 book by Francis Stone, Stonor Saunders, who the book was called, sorry, uh, Who Paid the Piper, CIA and the Cultural War, Cold War, which I've just bought. And I started reading through it to get this information. The Paul book this, be in that. Pardon? I'm guessing, I'm guessing Pollock will be in that one. I haven't read all of it, Chris, so, yeah. Um, the book discusses the mid-20th century Central Intelligence Agency efforts to infiltrate and co-opt artistic movements using funds that were mostly channeled through the Congress of Cultural Freedom and the Ford Foundation. Hail Ford. Hail Ford. Anti-Nazi, <laughs> pro-Nazi. There you go. This is, again, Operation Mockingbird. This is, this is it. That's what they did. Mm. You know, it's not just about having that uh, newsreader, that Vanderbilt newsreader, um, Anderson Cooper, mm. um, in in front of you constantly. This is actually deeper than that, isn't it? Because well, he's that, just the one that got caught in it. Yeah, that's blatant, isn't it? Yeah. Um, Orwell published three books with this this company, Secker and Warburg. Um, Homage to Catalonia, nineteen thirty eight. Animal Farm, nineteen forty five, and nineteen eighty four in nineteen forty nine. Uxley's wife sold the rights to Animal Farm to the CIA. Right. Why? So they could make that anti-communist animation film. Ah, right. I remember seeing that as a kid. I yeah. plugged my eyes out. You were in club against Yeah, no, terif- it terrifying, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the CIA are funding a cartoon, basically, that they're showing kids at school. They showed it as at school, that. Yeah. But that makes that as much wash, wash it down. Yeah, and uh, on a surface level, that, that makes as much sense as Jackson Pollock, doesn't it? Yes. It's like what? I don't. I know. But even more sense probably because kids aren't going to go and what look at Jackson Pollock, no. and they're the more open mind, aren't they? They're the, but, they're the but, mind. But they're still doing the same thing, just on a load of free thinking modern art people. If you know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The Mental. edgy. Yeah. 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 Uh, and when you start seeing this, I mean, we've not got far into this, and we're already seeing a picture that you've got Sir this, Earl that, CIA this, Ford Foundation, yeah. uh, book publishers who you, you wouldn't even think they're involved in anything, uh, yeah. the Congress of Freedom and all, all this nonsense that are all funded and people working for them, CIA agents and what have you, and we haven't even started yet. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, all well. He's up to his tits, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and if you think about it, subverting a population is easy. I mean, just ask Yuri Bezmanov. I mean, he, he wrote it out, didn't he? What yeah. subverting a, a, and undermining a population 20 is. 20 years to change I'm, everything. 20 years. I mean, how easy is it with a song? You just said you went to your mate's house, had a few beers, couldn't get a Beatles song out of your head. Mm-hmm. What that does then, it reminds you of that time. Mm-hmm. So... These songs, although they're created by uh, the CIA or the social controllers, you still can't get them out of your head, mm. you know? Um, when when I hear Kung Fu Fighting, it reminds me of me and you running around house yeah. d- dancing to Kung Fu Fighting, you know? Dressing gowns, pretending we Kung Fu Yeah, outfits. pretending we were uh, judo, judo outfits. Yeah. What a nice, what a nice scene. What, so, yeah, just uh, whether that is by distorting the truth via news agencies, et cetera, and then that goes on to change policies and attitudes. And you can see the domino effect uh, falling and the, the the piece has fallen into place. And it doesn't matter to them if that, oh, it, it didn't quite work, that plan. Just do it again. Just do it again. Get more people. Get more authors. Get more actors. Get I mean, more... it, it, is, it, is, it, is the plan of 1984 that we can look at it and go, we're not quite there. We're not in, <laughs> it's not as bad as 1984 yet. Mm. Is, is that, was that the point of it? So... 
you know, we'll go, yeah, but yeah, but ninety four. I mean, that's bloody grim. That's proper fascism. We're not, we're not quite yet there. But I mean, <clears> we're actually just, in a worse state. If, I'd say worse. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, just by telling us we, 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 it's total surveillance means, even if it isn't, it means it is. Mm. Yeah. Um, it requires a certain individual to do this work. The controllers need brown shirts, infiltrators, as Klaus Schwab said, we've infiltrated the cabinets of the world. <laughs> uh, people who can stand in front of a camera, camera like Boris Johnson and blatantly lie while saying, and on heart, is telling the truth. These are the people, aren't they? These are who, who we're um, seeing. Yeah, and your Wancocks. And your Wancocks, uh, your, your Tony Blairs. Um, I mean, this is no nothing new, has it? It's been going on for millennia. It's just become a lot more sophisticated, as we and others have shown in this series and many other episodes, like our uh, Sheep Farm three-part series on Sage um, that covered Spy B and Susan Mickey and her kind that involved uh, the nudge unit, mm. the psychological uh, terror that they've run on. We've seen it as a heightened terror during the last three years, but I think since 2001, <laughs> how much they've used that 1984 terror, you know, um, after 7-7 and things like that. Uh, yeah. yeah. And we've only, we only have to look back to March 2020 to see how deeply the controllers have lobotomized or brainwashed the masses. Mm. That is a, a new plimsoll line, isn't it, <clears throat> for them? Well, it must so be. Each one of these events, like um, 9-11, 7-7, the last three years, each one of them is traumatizing every society. Yes. You know. Mm. To levels that's never been done before. But also you're traumatizing the parents who are talking about it at home and the kids are hearing it, then it's passed down to their, you know. It's, 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 I mean, it's been a non-stop for the last 20 years when you think mm. about it, from... Too far from nine eleven to yeah. now. It's been nonstop. Yeah, really. Absolutely. You had, yeah, you had nine eleven. Then you had a series of miniature terrorist attacks. That, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, which were suspect at the best. Yeah. Um, and I think the same is happening with the um, recent three years. Well, again, like the Twilight language, a terrorist attack means something else, doesn't it? Yeah. A terrorist attack probably means to them a direct attack on a direct attack on the population. Terrorist attack on us. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it means. It doesn't mean that, you know, there's yeah. people out there wanting to get us. You know, it means his own government's going to get like, us. Like we've said before, a virus is, is it a virus of of a catching kind or is it a virus that's spread throughout humanity? Yeah. Are these psychopaths? Yeah, exactly. I would hazard a guess it is. Orwell wrote about the Ministry of Truth and then went on to work for the Information Research Department or the IRD. He also presented propaganda during World War II for the BBC. During World War II... His wife, psychologist Eileen O'Shaughnessy, worked for the censorship department of the Ministry of Information. <laughs> <laughs> Are you thinking about Orwell like you did before now, Chris? <laughs> Not quite, no. Yeah. I uh, mean, well, he even took those names, didn't he? Ministry of Truth and all yeah. that stuff. Yeah. Same, same name. Yeah. We will cover this in more detail um, in these episodes. Uh any form, I, I've come to the realisation now, Chris, any form of entertainment now has at least to be questioned. Or I can't, I can't even question it anymore, but I'm, I'll, I'll call, fall yeah. on that side of it because I still want to leave the question there. But it's at least got to be questioned as control. Yeah. Um, because it's been infiltrated on every level. They, they only need a few, I mean, you look at Netflix, Fatty, they only need a few nuggets in there. Yeah. And it's propaganda. Well, I mean, Netflix is a blatant piss take, isn't it? Because yeah. Edward Bernays's nephew. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just a piss take, isn't it? It, it has to be. Take. And like I've always said, if you take Netflix and that red writing and you put propaganda in there, yeah, it literally looks yeah. like... Like know, 1984. Did, it might as well just say 1984. Did, did, did that used to exist where it, propaganda is written in like that writing yeah. in red with the black background? I'm pretty sure it does somewhere. <laughs> what is it, entertainment? It means mind control. Elon Musk, Yuval Harari, all spring to mind as modern day sort of shapeshifters of the Twilight language. Because if you look at Elon Musk and Yuval Harari, they're delivering bad news in a way that Aldous Huxley delivered it and George Orwell. What is like Yuval the... Harari's uh, standpoint, Fire? Because my, my son just read one of his early books. And I thought mm. that was interesting because 
I was telling him that guy's Dodger. He's World Economic Forum. And yeah. he's like, no, I've read his, I think he's read his first one. And he was yeah. saying, no, no, it's just about an alternative version of history. Yeah. So I think that that first, because he was telling me what was in it, and he yeah. didn't sound too, um, you know, eugenicist, if you like. Mm. And I'm thinking he used that one to drag people in. Yeah. And what's it? What's his stance, that guy? Do you know? Well, he's, he's, he's warning people that, by telling them what's going to happen about with AI and stuff like that, mm. which is not dissimilar from what Orwell were doing. Yeah. Yeah. They're bringing bad news, but pretending that they're warning you about it all while working for secu- World, World Economic Forum or security agencies. Yeah. He's not warning you, yeah. But, he, but even that AI thing, which is massive now, and it? it's everywhere about AI this, AI that. Yeah. They're literally reaching that point of um, Terminator. Yeah. And even that word AI, artificial, they're telling you that it's artificial. Yeah. So it doesn't exist. No. It's just a data collection thing that the data will be the intelligence. So it's artificial. It's not real. It doesn't exist, does no. it? No. But how much of that are you seeing in the, in the you know, presses and it's everywhere now, isn't it? It's everywhere. I mean, again, the, the, the great reset before 2020, if you look at what's new now, um, you know, all these things like droughts and things like that. All these yeah. things are yeah. They're utilizing that, these now. That's the uh, that's the great reset. We've changed yes. the, we've changed the news feed and now it's AI. Um, Newspeak. Yeah. Global <laughs> global climate warming. I mean, that alarm thing, you know. <laughs> yeah. But that is all nineteen eighty four stuff, isn't it? Yeah, to be afraid yeah. of forest fires and floods. When yeah. have they ever bothered us? Mm. Never. I mean, if you look at the newscasters here in the UK, like Jeremy Vine, James O'Brien, Mariana Spring, Anna Fry, Brian Cocker, uh, and in America, Anderson Vanderbilt, CIA Cooper. Mm. You know, the all these people. What, what who were that guy that interviewed Bin Laden in that cave? And he got there before CIA. I mean, I, I, do, does anybody really believe that nonsense? Yeah. I mean, he worked for CNN, who's started by Ted Turner, who's a yeah. eugenicist, and obviously, yeah, yeah. And it's, the whole thing is just a setup from start to finish. I can't believe any of it now. It is like a science fiction, like like you're reading Terminator. That's what you're doing. Can, can it be any coincidence that O'Brien? Um, it's called O'Brien. Yeah. O'Brien from 1984. Four, I mean, yeah. is that is that a coincidence? Looking yeah. into it far too much. Operation Mockingbird, Project MK Ultra, Operation Cauldron, uh, are like Operation 2020, aren't they? Operation mm. 2020 Divock. Mm. They're still in operation. They're still going. They've just yeah. been finessed, haven't they? Yeah, exactly. One thing's becoming clearer. Orwell and his work and his ilk were security assets. Yeah, it's pretty obvious now, isn't it? It's pretty obvious that we haven't even got started. And we had this conversation about two or three years ago, I think. Well, probably long, even before the nonsense, actually. Yeah. About Orwell. Yeah. Because we both had a, um, suspicions, I think. Well, I had my suspicions, and it's nice where it links into um, the Huxley stuff, the Brave New World Order. Um, that's why I had to put, do more work on this, because he was taught at Eton by Aldous Huxley. Um, and, you know... Again, that's one of them nuggets that people fire out without um, yes. any connections no, or no disrespect to him, but yeah, without any, he needed more more looking into, didn't it? Than... Well, his main teach, one of his main teachers, uh, ASF Gowie, were called. Um, he was another um, one of the spy in the spy ring in Soviet count super spies, right? Um, and he's his teacher. He, he he was his mentor. He was his teacher at Eton. Um, and then he ended anyway. It's, we'll come to that, but it's it. I mean, all these things is when you look at coincidences, or he knows all these people, right, that are all linked back to intelligence, and then he's writing about the same stuff. I mean, and there's another story about his first wife, which when you hear that, you'll go <laughs> about 1984, right? Um, but I'm not going to tell it now, we'll wait for that. Born Eric Arthur Blair better known by his pen name or undercover intelligence alter ego name, George Orwell, 007. And that's a name we'll use from now on. Was an English novelist, essayist, journalist, and critic, and intelligence agent. His, that's my, me adding that bit, by the way. His work <laughs> is categorised by social criticism, opposition to totalitarianism, and support of democratic socialism. Now that sounds like World Economic Forum, 
You will own nothing and be very happy. Mm. He's known for his books, Animal Farm and 1984. They're the two famous ones, aren't they? Well, they, they, I would say that they're where, where, where he took a shift, actually, because the right. other ones were just, well, the ones were on about Wigan Pier and the Down and Out in London. But I think before that, he wrote like quite whimsical, like like um, like Aldous Huxley did, wrote quite mm. whimsical, you know, stories about current times, but just yeah. romances and all that stuff. But then how did he get to that, from that to get into 1984? I don't know. I don't know. It's strange how the book publisher that he got them two books uh, published for were getting funded via the CIA. <laughs> <laughs> and then he sold one of them yeah. to the CIA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it's quite explanatory. But yeah. Uh, yeah, when you look at it like that. Just, I mean, did, they have... did, did they sweep up a guy who was a normal author and then take him down that road? Or did well, they get, get, get rid of him? Did they get Please. rid of him? And uh, what, 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 yeah, yeah. What, were, that, so, what were their what were their songs before? Like Mike Williams has shown this, and mm. then the, comp, the compilations. Exactly. After, yeah, that's uh, exactly what I was trying to say. Yeah. So, but you could say something about Uxley as well because he was writing, you know, nineteen twenties society yeah. kind of novels. Yeah. Then all of a sudden, went totally different. Did, yeah. did they use that to get him famous and get him as a household name? <clears throat> and then take them in a different direction. Well, I, I think know. these these guys are though the the sort of the sort of household names, aren't they? People know them, but they're cult. No, I don't mean they? now. I mean were the yeah. household name then in yeah. the, like nineteen? You know, well, you know what I mean. There weren't any of the story of him signing his first book. It's a bit like the Beatles getting signed with George Martin, right? Yeah, because they thought his work were crap. Right. All right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that first book, uh, the. Uh, Paris and London one. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, it got, it, I think it got three turndowns. Right. It turned down three times before it got signed. I liked it. I, I liked that. Then, funnily enough, somebody okay. read it and said, I don't like it. And then they said, Well, I'll read it again. And they liked it and it got signed. <laughs> uh, uh, two months after, he would had a book deal. Anyway, right. we'll come to that. But yeah. yeah. So, Orwell was born 25th of June 1903 in Motihari, Bengal, British India into what he described as a lower upper middle class family, whatever that means. Um, <laughs> lower upper middle class family. Mm. Always father... In you another country. Yeah, in another the country. country. <laughs> in another country. Always father, Richard Walmsley Blair, worked for, worked as a sub-deputy opium agent. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> in the opium department of the Indian Civil Service, overseeing the production and storage of opium sales to China. All right. So he's a... Sounds like the of... East India Company. <laughs> some kind of drug peddler. We should affect it. What? Yeah. yeah. Some of Orwell's ancestors were also part of the East India Company, um, as we'll see in part two. Interestingly... Like gangsters. <laughs> yeah. Interestingly, two British anti-opium activists sat on the board of a Royal Commission on opium. One was Baron Joseph Pease and Arthur Pease. Peace family are one of the founding families of Barclays Bank. I think they're also involved with the Fabian Society. Edward Reynolds Pease, who we mentioned in episode one, was an English writer and a founding member of the Fabian Society. His mother was Susanna Ann Fry, who was also a Quaker from the prominent British family, uh, which founded and owned chocolate firm J.S. Fry and Sons. Fry's produced the first solid chocolate bar, Fry's Turkish Delight. <laughs> The company was originally called Anna Fry and Sons. Remember Anna Fry from the BBC? Mm. Wonder if she's got a link to them. <laughs> That'd be interesting, wouldn't it? Uh, Kraft now own. Uh, sorry, Fries are now owned by GM Food Company Kraft, who also own Cadbury's chocolate. Kraft used Heck Two Nine Three sweetness enhancers in their food. Heck Two Nine Three comes from aborted fetus cells, as we've shown in other. Uh, podcast. Also, the cra craft's interested, isn't it? The craft. It's the craft. Yeah. Craft the, uh, food. Which, yeah. No, craft. Which witchcraft. Must, well, witchcraft, and it's with a K instead of a C. Like mm -hmm. the magic. And you've got the craft. The, the Masonic Order is re referred to as the craft, isn't it? Is it? Yeah. yeah. We'll be discussing the Peace family in more detail in other episodes. And then also intermarried with the Huxley, Darwin, Wedgwood families. Obviously, uh, Cadbury's and Fry's chocolate were heavily involved in the slave trade, and Cadbury's are going to come back up again later on. Some of Orwell's ancestors, like the Limousin family from his mother's side, were heavily involved in Burma, 
via their timber businesses and other businesses which they own, which were also linked to the opening trade, opium trade. Orwell's ancestors were also slave trader stroke owners in Jamaica. In fact, as we will see in the next episode, on the BBC website, the headline was, George Orwell's ancestors uh, stroke family were among 3,000 slave owners which received compensation. Orwell was descended from Charles Blair, a Scot who made a fortune in Jamaica before uh, marrying into the English aristocracy. That's bollocks fair because George Orwell was a working class guy who wrote for lower the middle upper middle lower. Class. No, he, yeah. he wrote for the Yorkshire Post. Yeah, lower upper middle lower middle class lower. Fucking hell! Shatter your heroes or what? <laughs> Sorry, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> and his dad worked for. Uh, Dad was selling uh, smack to uh, Chinese people. <laughs> <laughs> the the sub deputy opium agent. It's the right title, that isn't it? Okay. Where's my card? What are you? Sub deputy opium agent. Opium agent. Yeah, for the opium department of the Indian Civil Service. Yeah. Again, drug, who, a drug dealer. Who were those gurus? Legitimized working, drug dealer. Who were those gurus working for? Hmm. The Indian Civil Service. Orwell's father, Richard Blair. Uh, isn't it strange that 200 years on, we're still talking about the opium epidemic that's poisoning mm. millions of people legally now every day? Yeah. 80,411 people in the US died of a drug-involved overdose um, caused by opioids, according to the National Institutes of Health in 2021. Fucking hell. That's, that's just in America. That's a pandemic. That's just in the US. In 1999, it was 10,000 a year. Wow. Not even, wow, bloody hell. Not even talked about fair. No. But no. they did They did make a, um, <clears throat> a TV TV film series about it. Yeah. But, sure, I mean, yeah, about even, it. I bet, I bet that didn't tell you it was 80,000. No. There's, there's as many people now dying a year, like if you think that 80,000, has died on the American side, if you believe the figures, 58,000 in Vietnam. Yeah, in total. So, and just put it into some context. The current nonsense, same context. Yeah. Let's not worry about it because fucking Charles is becoming king on Saturday. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't worry about any of this shit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> also, in episode two, we spoke about the Indian Civil Service. They employed the fathers and family members of the gurus who were educated at Oxbridge and at London School of Economics by the British Raj and then went to, on to educate the 60s musicians, writers, poets, philosophers, and filmmakers using Indian twilight language. Same thing. Mm. It's just the same thing, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Utilising the same sort of track. Through the social connections of his mother, she was of French extraction. Ida Blair's father was a wealthy Burmese uh, teak timber merchant, Charles Limousin, gained Orwell a scholarship to St. Cyprian's School, Eastbourne, East Sussex. Arriving at St. Cyprian's School in September 11, sorry, September 1911, <laughs> he, he boarded at the school for the next five years, returning home only for school holidays. Orwell hated the school. I mean, we heard, we heard that with Johnson, didn't we? Mm. Yeah. And also... How do you go from being in a boarding school to being down and out penniless in Paris and London? Yeah. Well, who's, what I'd say is who's paying for all this stuff? Because That's what I mean. Once yeah. you get in a, uh, if you're lower middle class, lower middle, whatever it was, they said. Don't go to boarding school. Um, no, no. That, unless you, you've got a bloodline. Again, it comes back to that bloodline that's been spotted. As we get into the next episode, when we see the bloodline, we'll realise why this man... W was probably put there because it's like this. You you explained it fan, fantastically when you said about um, Omen. I know she paused, paused there because she didn't want to say I'd said something fantastic. No, when you put it, equated <laughs> these things to because I, I haven't been able to equate it, but you, where Damien went always yeah. through his life didn't realize that he were getting leg ups all the time. Yeah, and then that that military commander who's played by the guy Lambs. Hedrickinson's, who right. played Bishop in Alien, and he pulls him to one side and says, we're here to help you, kind of thing. Mm. I can't remember exactly what he says, yeah. but he didn't know that he's the Antichrist. Yeah. And he does, and he's like a military, high-up military guy. Yeah, And I'm not saying, oh, well, we're Antichrist, but 
There's a certain. <laughs> that, that's what I'm saying about. Well, I, th- I think that's a, that's a, that, that, I think that's a peep. That film, I think, I was a peep into the, how these families operate, even though they're not antichrists, etc. Mm. But for instance, maybe someone knew that Orwell was of that bloodline, and he didn't know. Yeah, and he got led into being an author, and then got slowly led into 1980. Who, who knows? Or did someone else write it, bump him off, mm. and then the book comes out, and they've already got an established author's, author's name behind it? I don't know. Mm. It says on Britannia.com uh, website that their attitudes were those of the landless gentry. We're talking about uh, Orwell's family, as Orwell's later called the lower middle class people, whose pre- pre- pretensions to social status had little relation to their income. Orwell was thus brought up in an atmosphere of impoverished snobbery. After returning with his parents to England, he spent he was sent in 1911 to a preparatory boarding school in Sussex, where he was distinguished among the other boys by his poverty and his intellectual brilliance. Poverty? You don't you don't go to boarding school and travel all to all these different countries in them days and be impoverished. Yeah. Well, it reminded me of. Travelling uh, was a lot more expensive in them days. Fact, it reminded me of the Chris Witty story. Reminded yeah. me of the Chris Witty story where, granted, his father got killed in Greece, but mm. then they got sent to that college. Mm. Um, he was working for the opium for the British government. All right, it's Indian civil service, but it's the British civil service, right? Uh, which is based at the Foreign Office. Yeah. Mm. Um, and then he gets sent to a private school. Yeah. yeah. Now, I'm not saying private schools are bad, so I get a lot of grief for this. But what I'm trying to say is that. There's a line where they can keep an eye on these people at certain schools. When we hear the history of this school, we'll see that it seems a bit it seems a little odd. Orwell would have been seven or eight years old at this time, fresh from India. At St. Cyprian's, uh, Orwell first met a guy called Cyr- Cyril Connolly CBE, who I mentioned at the beginning. He started up um that Horizon magazine that ended up working with that guy who was part of the CIA, right? Mm. So Cyril Connolly, who also became a writer and who as editor of Horizon magazine, published Orwell's early essays. Cyril Connolly's childhood days were spent with his father in South Africa and with his mother's family at the Clontarf Castle in County Dublin, owned by his mother's family. Muriel Maud Vernon, daughter of Colonel Edward Vernon. We will circle back to Cyril Connolly's CB and Horizon magazine um, later in this episode, but back to St Cyprian School, which was an English preparatory school for boys, which operated in the early 20th century in Eastbourne, East Sussex. The school was founded in 1899 by Louis Chitty, that's C-H-I-T-T-Y, Vaughan Wilkes, and his wife, Cicely Ellen Philadelphia Comin. A newly married couple in their 20s. I'll ask you this. Does this sound feasible, Chris? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That a newly married couple in 1899, in their 20s, would open a preparatory school for boys. No. If you're wondering how a couple in their 20s opened this private school, here goes to their connections. I could find very little about their past, but their eldest son, John Cumming Vaughan Wilkes, born 30th of March 1902 and died 1986, was an English educationalist who was warden of Radley College, and an Anglian priest. He went to Eton too. Uh, George Orwell and Cyril Connolly followed him to Eton as scholars from his parents' school. Wilkes Jr. married Joan Allington, a daughter of Cyril Allington, who was an English educationist and scholar himself, cleric and author. Cyril Allington was the headmaster at Eton College. He also served as chaplain to King George V. His father came from a long line of clerics, a branch of landed gentry, and was descended from the Allentons of Horseheath, an ancient Cambridgeshire family, from which he also descended the barons of Allington. His wife was Hester Margaret Littleton, daughter of George Littleton, fourth Baron Littleton, who was the eldest son of the third Baron Littleton and Lady Sarah Spencer. Yes, those Spencers. Right. right. The Littleton seat is at Hagley Hall in Worcestershire. One of the Littleton daughters, Elizabeth, married future Prime Minister Sir Alec Douglas Hom, also known as Earl of Hom, Home, sorry, a title in the peerage of Scotland. And I'm going to come on, he's going to be mentioned quite a lot in this 
uh, episode is Sir Alec Douglas Home, future Prime Minister. Um, another daughter, Lavinia Sybil Allington, married Sir Roger Miners, full name, Roger Aubrey Baskerville Miners. Um, his country residence is Trago Castle in Hertfordshire. And he, he was also a friend and one of the pupils at Eton with George Orwell. Right. So these things come round. So the owners of St. Cyprian's are linked to Orwell via him marrying into the family of the people that started Cyprian's college up. This is <laughs> a Cyprian school up. And, and their school uniform was a green shirt, pale blue collar, corduroy breeches and cap with a Maltese cross for a badge. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that crops up a lot, doesn't it? Yeah, <laughs> the Maltese bit, yeah. crosser. Interesting, here we go again with the Huxley Connections. St. Tri Cyprian's ran, school ran with the prevailing ethos of muscular Christianity, which had typified private education since the time of Thomas Arnold of Rugby School and placed much emphasis on developing self-reliance and integrity or character. Thomas Arnold was the grandfather of Sir Julian and Aldous Huxley via their mother, Julia Arnold Huxley. Thomas Arnold was an English educator and historian Headmaster of Rugby School from 1828 to 1841. He introduced several reforms that were widely copied by other noted schools. The son of William Arnold, another customs officer, and was related to the Arnold family of the landed gentry of Lowscroft. French aristocrat Baron de Coubertin considered Thomas Arnold the father of organised sport. When he visited English public schools, including rugby, in 1886, when looking at Arnold's tomb in the school chapel, he recalled, and he felt suddenly as if he were looking on the very cornerstone of the British Empire. I don't. We don't get said about any of our family about that, do you? Do? <laughs> Who was Pierre Coub de Coubertin? He was a French educator and historian, we seem to be getting a lot of them, and founder of the International Olympic Committee and its second president, He's known as the father of the modern Olympic Games. Just to think what this actual means here, right? He's saying Huxley's ancestors were the founder of organised sport as we now know it. Hmm. Another mind control mechanism. Well, sport was considered <clears throat> uh, for children, wasn't it? Uh, what he's doing there is bringing it into stadium sport, adult, the adult world. It was considered a kid's, kid's thing. For mm. a, up until this point, I think, yeah. Um, and then what we're bringing stadium spa back, they're basically bringing the Roman bread and circus back, aren't they? Yes, yeah. And look at us now, look where we are now, yeah. I mean, probably America more than us, but internationally obsessed with stadium spa, yes, and and concerts, concerts as well, yeah, yeah. I mean, that that's I would say the concert thing's pr probably happened in our lifetime, but the yeah. stadium sport thing, I mean, it's just gone to insanity. Yeah, um, it does. When it started, if you think of Huddersfield, where we're from, Leeds Road, is it? Yeah, where yeah. it was a um, small little thing, three quid to get in. Then they got into whatever division. I don't know sport, but how much is it for a ticket now for? I don't know. I haven't been down for a while, but it won't be three quid. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you that. No, but even in, even in balance of um, what it should be, you know, of yeah. wages back in the 80s, if you like, Um it's yeah. ridiculous. It used to be a working man could take his kids every week. It's uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know the numbers because I don't watch it, but you know it's stupid money in it now to go and watch a football game. Well, it's just a drain, isn't it? It's a financial drain, but an energy drain. I mean, look how much time's wasted when you're there, how much time you spent ranting and raving at games. And it, it, if, you, if you ever wanted a, an example of Monsters, Inc., yeah. football or sporting events is one of those because you're venting energy. Uh, a level that you can't even imagine. You know, you know, something dawned on me about sport recently. Actually, I was talking to Mrs. about this. You know, I don't like football, right? Mm. But I don't mind activities. So I like swimming and I like drinking, ski, skiing, and yeah. drinking. Yeah. But but what I mean is, um, I even I even don't mind kicking a football about. The trouble is, right? As soon as you start, if you kick a football, and this is going back twenty years when I was younger, kick a football around for a bit of fun, everyone turns into a prick. Yeah. So it's become that, you know, like cooking. I'm a cook. I'm a chef by trade. It's it's become where it's not 
you can't just do it because you're ultra competitive and fit and, exactly and feeding people. You've got to be hungry. You've got to do you want it? You know, like Gordon Ramsay. Yeah. Do you want it? You've got to be like that. You can't just fucking enjoy it, can you? No, you've got, it's got to, you've got to be competing against someone or you're gonna have this invented purpose someone. for doing it. It's gonna be a reason for doing it, not just feeding your family. Yeah, you've got to be showing off or competing, not or, just putting love it into and, it. Yeah, exactly. And feeding your you know your family or your friends or whatever. But yeah. like sport, it can't just be a kickabout and a bit of fun. It's got to be, uh, uh, you know. Uh, I might take on. a paint and just splat paint on. Well, they've done it with that. Uh, yeah. They've done it. They've done it with um, pottery, haven't they? I think there's mm. a pottery show where it's competitive pottery. <laughs> they've done it with fucking sewing fire, baking, yeah. the great Bake Off, competitive. Yeah. It should be the the ultimate, you know, show turn of, off, <laughs> <laughs> show of love and affection for who you feed it. Not it doesn't yeah. have to be competitive. No, and it's horrible. And it started with um, what's that twat called? That Amstrad guy. Um, Alan Sugar, that that thing. Yeah, yeah. Donald yeah. Trump did it in America. Yeah. I remember it Prentice. going down that road where everything was da da dum da dum da dum dum And and do you know anybody in business that's nothing like business that? Of course it well do you think watching cooking shows is anything like no, cooking in real life? No, no. No, no it's not. So I mean, again, this comes back to that uh mind control. So you've got these uh the Huxley's inventing sport. You've got the TV being used as a controlling mechanism. They're now inserting things that cooking is a real thing for argument's sake, but now it's been turned into a, just a a sideshow, really, a competitive event where, in reality, nobody cooks anymore. Everyone just warms stuff up in a microwave. Mm. But yet they're showing you how how, how useless you are because you can't cook like this. Like they can, yeah, exactly. Like they That's can, so, yeah. yeah. You can't skate like they can. You yeah. can't do this like they can. And I remember Alan Watt saying that sport was put there on TV. Um, it feel like shit. To make you feel like, well, look how strong that guy is, and you mm. weak pieces. You know, you come home from work, you open yeah. a can of beer, you're having a bag of crisps, <laughs> and you're watching the <laughs> with these footballers Super fit running, athlete running around, around. Yeah. keel yeah. over. And then, <laughs> no. you, and then, and then you've got the other versions that, which is like magazines, like you know, like women's magazines, just showing yeah. you all these and the, the fashion world, which is yeah. another brainwashing program in the same vein, in the same which vein. is showing you all these models and how brilliant they're looking, clothes and mm. miserable they are in the face. Okay. We're about 90 minutes into the Huxley Brave New World Order series, and this is episode four, Mockingbird, which is about George Orwell, and this will be in two episodes, uh, so it'll be four and five of the Huxley Brave New World series. So to kickstart this last section of part one, I'm going to introduce a few more characters who were close to, or part of, as I think we can all get our heads around now, um, the Orwell operation, as I'm going to call it. And you remember from that first part, Chris, where all those characters, the book, the book publishers, the people who own the book publishers, all these people that were involved in basically making Orwell a thing. Yeah. These people look like they facilitated the plan of building up a persona of Orwell, who in turn went on to write, if he did go on to write, it might be another Mike Williams Beatles-esque thing with the musicians and writers, etc. And if he existed as well. Um, and he went on to write the coming totalitarian agenda decades before it even happened. That's the part I find um, strange. Not only are they writing about strange things that are happening, they're writing about them in different times, aren't they? So there's 70 years ahead of a time and it actually comes true more or less how they wrote it like hg wells etc but not quite as bad i would say <laughs> not quite as bad no what i mean is um his version of it as he says in the book is uh envision a boot stamping on a human head forever and ever right whereas he didn't quite get to that did it that's a fascist version i suppose yeah <clears throat> brave new world's more of a um i think that's more probably where we are i think where it's you know, you'll enjoy your servitude kind of thing. Yeah. Whereas yeah. It's, 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 there's bits of each, isn't there? What, the one thing I found most interesting about um, 1984 is the surveillance thing, which is true, and the fact that your TV could watch you, which is mm. also true. Yeah. Now, but we're not, I mean, in, in, the, in the 1984 world, the force, they've got to leave the TV on watching them at all times. Right. So if you remember, Winston goes in a corner so he can write in his journal um, so the TV can't quite see him. 
Well, when they bring these digital credits in, if you think, yeah, if you're not on your TV screen monitored every whatever minute, hour, whatever, the if your fifty uh, communist credits for that month <laughs> might reduce by point two well, five type of thing, it, you know. It, it, it's even simpler than that, really, because you you won't be able to spend money on things. Well, on a, on a very basic level, you can't dodge any tax, can you? No. Well, um, I, I were opening. We were opening. Me and my wife were opening a bank account, and in my name, because I don't use apps, you couldn't do certain things because you weren't using apps. Yeah. yeah. I booked an Airbnb the other day, and I had to show government identification. Right. I.e passport or a driving license at first i got a bit freaked out but then i thought it's kind of fair enough and it's you turn up at someone's house <laughs> and they just want a picture of you basically so yeah. it's, it's all part of the same thing it's that softly yeah, yeah. softly we're going in all day for a break uh, yeah. can you just give me a driving license please you know well you, you said dri passport? driving license passport or of a government id yeah, yeah. just you, just that phrase there says government id have you got your papers yeah didn't need to write government id no i could have said uh, photo ID. But the, uh, do you think this is the like the new language now that people are being used to? Mm. And uh, you know, you, you you're signing documents, uh, or Google documents, ticking a box. You know, everybody, nobody reads those terms and conditions, and yet it's legal just to tick a box. Yeah, and even if you start to read them, they bore you to death. You wouldn't understand very, it very you quickly. Yeah, it. and it's written in. Yeah, you wouldn't understand it because it's written in Twilight language. Double speak. Yeah. Double speak, and so. They know you're not going to read it, but yet it's still legal just to have that tick yeah. box to tick and sign your life away. How many times in a, in a year? Yeah. How many times? I mean, every, every time you go onto any web page now, you have to accept it's con whatever. And you always yeah. reject them, don't you? Mm. Occasionally you accept them by mistake. But they're just trying to bore you to death. We'd be this, so you just say yes, 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 yes. And this is the new brave, the, the brave new world order, isn't it? Mm. This is the World Economic Forum. Mm. You you will own nothing and be happy. Enjoy your servitude. Death by box tickers and bureaucracy. Yeah. So sheep dipping Orwell, if he existed, building up that person, persona of a literary genius, of a man who came out of nowhere with humble beginnings from the lower middle class, ex upper class, slave plantation owning family. <laughs> <laughs> who, who happened to be able to go to St. Cyprian's and Eton via free scholarships. Yeah, a conveyor a belt, just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and I'm I'm not saying that these people aren't talented. They probably are talented. That's why they veered off into that direction. But, but maybe they're talented more of acting the part, mm. not necessarily being the person that they're acting about. Or or are they any more talented than numerous other of us? Um, no, proles. No. <laughs> yeah, but, proles. Yeah. But they just get chosen because they're of that blood or that that, that lineage. lineage. Yeah. yeah, but but yeah, but when you think about it, if I were plucked out from uh, whatever young age, even a teenager, and said, "Right, you're going to be mm. in the Rolling Stones, and mm. you're going to be play, play guitar," we're going to train you to yeah. be week in, week out, day in, day out. Game. Yeah, yeah, it's not that hard, is it? No, you you would get to a certain standard, whether you were, well, even if you were totally crap, you would get to a certain standard. And also, music, music, and, and art as well are two ones where you can actually see talent i'm not saying this is an embittered artist myself but <laughs> you can see you can see talent and you can see talent that's chosen can't you yeah um you know for instance i mean i'm not picking on anyone but if you think of like tracy emin that woman who did the, <clears throat> the tent um you know you, you can see we all know artists and musicians who are really good and they've yeah. never got anywhere, basically. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. And and they always say, well, they just weren't in the right place at the right time. or they weren't, No, they weren't no. plucked out. I mean... Yeah. yeah. They weren't uh, supposed to be in the right place at the right time. Exactly. I mean, I'm sure there is, I'm sure there is ones who scra scra scrape through. I think there are, yeah. It has to be, but... Yeah. I, mean, I don't it, think the majority are made up of these people. They do a lot... A lot again, I call them successful peasants if you like yeah where they are allowed in whether it's in business or whether it's in you know mm. but then they can then be utilized can't they yeah. i know when yeah. i do some of the genealogy on certain people it's very hard to find yeah. russell brand's one of those you've got to do a lot of guessing which i don't like and i think some of these people like brand um whose lineage seemed to appear in the 1700s um that he he maybe did come from 
like royal background, possibly. In, but I can't prove that. But I think some of these people are allowed in because they will follow the orders and do the brown shirt job for them. Mm. And uh, yeah. Like Wankok. Did Wankok have any lineage? I can't remember. Well, no, he was married in. His, his yeah, ex-wife married in, didn't was uh, Baron such and such and such. Yeah. I, I, I seem to remember. Yeah. Uh, and so his kids are like like that. But yeah. But he, he stunk someone who was gagging for it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. He, he, again, a successful peasant. It was from, uh, his, I think his mum and dad were business people that put him through the f- uh, schools. But but there's nothing wrong with that per se. Again. No. I don't care what There's schools... nothing wrong with any of it. There's no, I don't have schools... into money or anything. No, no. I don't care what schools I went into. It's what the person stands for and does and actions that count for anything. What's their intent? You know, that's their prerogative. But when they attempt to sell us or tell us that they were poor from a, what were it, lower middle class family, um, and they tell us these things don't matter, the re- what they're really doing is insulting us. Mm. Because they do matter. And the fact is, they're covering something important up. Um, when Orwell left these schools, apparently advised by his teacher, stroke mentor at Eton, ASF Gow, don't know anybody called ASF, uh, goes by their initials, um, on a number of occasions throughout his life, were led to believe that this idealistic, anti-totalitarian decided he'd skip going to Oxford. Instead, he joined the British Raj-controlled Indian police force. Odd move, isn't it? Yeah, but he, he, and we'll come on to this in in this episode or maybe the next one. He was in it for five years, so he wouldn't like. He didn't go in it for a year and thought, "Well, I don't yeah. like this. I'm leaving." I mean, bear in mind he was born in India. Um, mm. We're also led to believe he washed up in kitchens in Paris and tramped in London. And when he reads some of these stories about his book, uh, he was funded by his auntie, um, one of the limousines. Uh, were funded by this other guy as well um it sounds like this is how operations are run find out this is your role and if you do this role we'll give you these this fame and whatever to follow and then he's got a nice spicy background hasn't he to legitimize animal farm in 1984 yes he went on to fight uh in the spanish civil war as an yeah. anti-fascist pro-communist while having tb Right, he's done. Even yeah. before I thought about it like this, I remember thinking that Spanish Civil War was a weird one. Yeah. That's a, I suppose that's just to prove that he's an anti-fascist, and then he goes yeah. on to write 1984. I suppose that's setting up that, isn't it? Maybe. He also got shot, apparently, through the throat or in the throat. That is a spicy uh, life. <laughs> yeah. There's no, no, I, I couldn't find a picture. I looked for pictures of him with a wound or convalescing. Yeah. Bear in mind he had TB then. So in 1930, before he went to Spain... He'd yeah. been, um, anyway, funded to go to Morocco to recover from uh, tuberculosis. Right. Then he went to fight in Spain. Right. I mean, and he died in his 40s. I mean, he got yeah. a lot done, didn't he? He got um, a lot done. Makes then, you wonder, then, in fact, did he, without without knowing at all, I'm totally making this up, did, did he die in one of these situations, like when he got shot in the throat and then they produced the new war? Well, who knows? Yeah. Yeah, the new one, yeah. Mark Two. <laughs> yeah. um, would it surprise you? Um, no. I mean, what what got me, it, and I and I think you've said this to me as well, but it stood out. He went to and wrote his two iconic books, uh, Animal Farm and 1984, that didn't fit in with any of his other books mm. or his essays that he wrote up to that point. Well, like um, like Huxley with all yeah. his, his his early books. I think they were all like social commentaries on being. Uh, and biography type books yeah. and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. And then he went on to do so a similar kind of thing, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Orwell finished up basically doing everything he said he was against, like working for the security agencies of the British government and the British Raj or the Information Dis- Research Department, fingering possible communist sympathizers, even though he were apparently a communist. Mm. <laughs> An interesting one, his teacher, ASF Gao, and I'll just give you a snapshot of this. He never married, and he was master at Eton College between 1914 and 1925. He was Orwell's principal tutor, ASF Gao. Gao was rumoured to be one of the Cambridge Five super spies, um, the double agent type characters. Um, we'll cover this a bit later on. Um, it was something I could have gone and into 
in uh, very much de- a lot of detail, but obviously time. But these patterns go through this presentation, spies, um, homosexuals, bloodlines, and working for the British Raj, or being born in India, being part of that Indian sort of culture. It, it, it reminded me of, you know, in Ireland, where they called it the Troubles, and it were like, but they, re- they trained a lot of security agencies um, and special forces in Ireland, because it was a live event, if you like. And that remind India reminded me of the same thing. Well, they did the same in Iraq, didn't they? Yeah. Um, when trained them all, then left. Mm. Uh, I do want to point out that I, all this research here, I've edited it because otherwise it'd have gone on for hours. It's probably going to be another hour and a half. So, so it'd be a three hour episode, this no doubt. But um, yeah. <clears throat> so who were Orwell's handlers, helpers, stroke insiders? Um, put in place or used to grease his tracks. One of them uh, that stands out is a guy called Cyril Con- Connolly, CBE, who was a very close friend and confidant of Orwell's, who also went to St. Cyprian's and Eton, but he was a year younger than Orwell. Connolly set up a, a magazine, another magazine, a Ryzen magazine, where aspiring writers like Orwell published essays and early short stories. A lot of these magazines, and we we worked out in uh, earlier on in this episode that these magazines are were funded by people who work within the security agency, mm-hmm. and CIA, MI5, and probably others as well. And here's a bit of uh, background on Cyril Connolly, who, in my opinion, has all the hallmarks of being a possible security asset. Connolly's father was a military commissioned officer. Major Matthew William Kemble Connolly. And I'm not saying anybody with a military background is working for MI6 either. Um, a lot of people in that day and age had a military background. Major Matthew Connolly, educated at Haleybury College and trained at the Royal Military College in Sandhurst, or at Sandhurst. Haleybury, formerly Haleybury and Imperial Service College since the 60s, is a member of the rugby group of schools. There's that Uxley link again with Thomas Arnold, inventor of modern sport. Connolly's paternal grandfather was Vice Admiral Matthew Connolly. Connolly's mother was Muriel Maud Vernon, daughter of Colonel Edward Vernon, who owned and lived in Clontarf Castle, County Dublin, who he met while serving in Ireland. That's him met Muriel while serving in Ireland. Clontarf Castle in Dublin, or in Clontarf, Dublin, Ireland, at one point in its history, Clontarf was held by the Knights Templar. The Cromwellian conquest of Ireland, the Con- Contarf Castle, was given to Captain John Blackwell. Blackwell afterwards sold his interest to John Vernon, quartermaster general of Crom- Cromwell's army. So we, we get, we're building up an history of who this chap is and why apparently was a famous critic, this uh, Cyril Connolly. The Vernon family was also to remain in possession of this castle, this estate, for over 300 years. John Vernon... 1618 to 1670, Quartermaster General of Oliver Cromwell's army and third son of Sir Edward Vernon of Staffordshire, England. The Vernon family was, is a prolific, wealthy and widespread English family with 11th century origins in Vernon, Normandy, France. Their titles include Baron Vernon, the Vernon and Vernon Baronets of Shopwick Park. There have been three baronesses created for members of the Vernon family. Members of other branches of the Vernon family have been created like Baron Vernon and the Earl of Shipbrook. That's Shipbrook. William de Vernon arrived in England at the time of the Norman Conquest and was granted lands in the county of Palatine of Chester under the patronage of Hugh de Avarachers, first Earl of Chester. His son, Richard de Raymond de Vernon, was created baron and seated at Shipbrook Castle near Northwich Cheshire. Cheshire. It'll, it'll all come clear why I'm going into this background of this guy I'd never heard of. Had you heard of him, Chris? No. No, never heard of. Um, because this is seems to be how it works. Incidentally, in future presentations, you'll, we're going to go into a bit of detail about Cheshire, because uh, there's a place in Cheshire called Huxley, 
with two right. large halls called Lower and Upper Huxley Halls. Right. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up, Chris, if you wanted to. So with this Vernon line through his mother, Muriel Maud Vernon, as I said at the beginning, Cyril Connolly has all the hallmarks of being a possible security asset. Military schools, title genealogy, and as what you'll see, the right friends in the right places. Cyril Connolly ran Horizon magazine with people who had intelligence links. One of them was Victor William or Peter Watson, as he went by. He was a wealthy English art collector and benefactor. You can just picture the sort, can't you, Chris, the type of person. Mm. This guy's going around the world, uh, buying pieces of art, looking at pieces of art, etc., funding things. He was also um, Sonia Brownell's mentor. That's Orwell's second wife. So right. this is before Orwell married her. Is that how he met her? He met her, I think, at Horizon really? magazine, yes. Watson was the son of Sir George Watson, first baronet. Watson Jr. was the principal benefactor of the Institute of Contemporary Arts in London and also provided financial assistance to the English and Irish painters, including Francis Bacon, Lucian Freud and John Craxton. Lucian Freud, grandson of Sigmund, Sigmund Freud. You, yeah. know he had, you know, they reckon he had 40 kids, Lucian Freud. Mad, isn't it? To different women. Only yeah. 14, I think, have been legitimised, but they reckon he had a fight. I don't know that much about me. Mrs. knows a lot about uh, more than me. And she says he wasn't a very nice character. No, well, I'm finding a lot. We mentioned Freud in Sonia Brownwell. Um, she had, I'm sure she would have had an affair with either Lucian. I think it was Lucian she had a, yeah, an affair with. Yeah, um, And Francis Bacon comes back into this. He's Francis, an interesting character. Francis Bacon... Um, bailed Sonia Brownell uh, out um, when she was basically penniless. Right. Um, I mean, to be fair, Lucian Freud paintings are pretty pretty good. Francis Bacon's a bit more modern artesque, if you like, but yeah. I liked him when I was a kid. But did I like him? I was told I liked him. Yeah, <laughs> you know probably, I mean? probably a bit of both. Yeah. Um, Watson was an avid art collector acquiring works by artists such as Miro, is it Miro or Miro? Uh, Klee? and Pablo Picasso, which were displayed in his Paris apartment in the 1930s. As we saw earlier, these organisations, like the Institute of Contemporary Arts, were, or could have been, controlled by intelligence services. Watson funded the literary magazine Horizon, so he funded it when it was launched during World War II in 1940. Is that what we needed during World War II? Like <laughs> I was going to say, good magazine? time to, good well, good time well, to launch that. During Blitz? <laughs> something for you to read in, in underground while you're getting bombed yeah. um, Watson was the youngest of three children his brother Sir Norman James Watson second baronet and his sister feminist Florence Nagal Watson you, you also see this a lot of the, the ladies that are involved are sort of like part of the feminist, feminist movement Movement, yeah yeah, it will be because it's another organised <laughs> event it's high up isn't it yeah. and I found it strange that as far as I could find in genealogy searches. His elder brother and sister also had no children. His sister was married but divorced but couldn't find any marriage for his brother. Watson was gay. And a lot of these people within this, what we're talking about now, and I've got no problem with gay people, not homophobic at all. And I know Chris, in, what you're doing is following the evidence. And, and I, it's the first time I've come across where lots of people were openly gay. And these are artists, stroke, authors, etc. Um, and that's another thing that was used against people by the security services. I was going to say that, that in them days would have been, a, I mean, you could still get arrested for it, couldn't you? So yeah, you could. In them days, talking here. Yeah, he, he didn't, he, he was, it was a big thing to get brought out as gay because you could literally go to prison. Well, and, you'd, and shamed. You'd, I, mean, yeah. I mean, that carried on right up to the 80s when we were kids. So yeah, it, imagine it what probably, it was like yeah. in that Society photographer, artist and set designer and royal photographer, Sir Cecil Beaton, began a lifelong obsession with Watson, though the two never became lo lovers. One of Watson's lovers was the American male prostitute and socialite, Denham Fouts, spelled F-O-U-T-S. 
whom he continued to support even after they separated as a result of Fouts' drug addiction. Fouts was described as the most expensive male prostitute in the world. Fouts was found dead in 1948 in his bathroom in Rome, aged just 34. Watson was also found drowned in his bath on the 3rd of May 1956 at his home in Knightsbridge, London. Some have suggested that he was murdered by his young American lover, Norman Fowler. Fowler inherited the bulk of Watson's estate, and he too was found drowned in his bathtub 14 years later in the West Indies. What brand of bathtub was it? <laughs> Remind, reminds me of that Jim Morrison story. Yeah, with his girlfriend. Yeah. yeah, numerous other people have been found in a bath dead. Yeah. Um, so what, what I'm trying to say, it's not just music or acting. Mm. This is going on. Whatever's behind all this is going on within all was these that, was that entertainment. The, yeah, was that the star hitting? That was it going on back then? You know, where no. they where they basically whack someone and then get their inheritance one way or another. Yeah, it's the same. Yeah. It's the same story, isn't it? Maybe he bought some pictures that somebody else wanted, um, and he said he wouldn't sell them. Mm. Um, well, good way to move money around, isn't it? In uh, art. Yeah. Well, a lot of these pictures that they they don't even show them. They're not even on display, are they? They keep them in private little galleries in the and occasionally bring them out on display. Yeah. Yeah. But it's just uh, it's again it's just it's another corrupt um, art for, well art art form but probably more corrupt than most because they choose who is going to be the next big name and they choose who's painting is going to be worth a fortune in years to come. Do you know well, what I mean? The, the difference is with like, this and like music, music, Chris, is that music has to be out there to be good. Yeah, art doesn't, does it? No, like we said before, no, no disrespect to Tracy M, but you can just. Fucking get an old tent out and it's worth millions. <laughs> Wait, which is what it was in a bed, wasn't it? What was it? A yeah. bed that she slept with loads of people on and she just re I mean, come on. I mean I know. I once challenged our Seb to um when he was younger, because he was into art, obviously. And um we were in Soho looking in an art shop and I, and he said, Oh, Tracy Emin's famous, didn't she? I said, I challenge you to find anything any of any decentness in that book. I said, I'll give you twenty quid if you find some. And he went, All right, you know, you can imagine mm. like a young teenager. He's flicking through it and he went, I can't find anything. No. I mean, if you're an artist, you could, your art book should at least have some decent art. You know? Well, again, it's one of those waking moments for you because a lot of these people you looked yeah. up to, yeah. but now you're looking in the backgrounds and just like these authors, like musicians and people like that, and you're realising that, I mean, that was funded by CIA. That's yeah. part of MI5, 6 yeah. operation. You're realising yeah. that what we're seeing is... It, it isn't what we've been told. And, and, and like music, films, uh, you, you're told what the best is. Mm. What's important? That's an important yeah. artist. That's an important film. That's an important musician. None of it's important. It's just entertainment. Yeah, it's entertainment. Um, yeah. And anyway, in, in 1940, um, Watson, as I said, provided funding for Connolly's Horizon magazine, and he became its arts editor. How many editors do they need? I've counted about four of them. Um, <laughs> considering it, it only published a small circulation of around 9,500 uh, magazines or uh, copies, but it had an impressive list of contributors, and it made up a significant impact in the arts uh, world during and after World War II. I, I read somewhere that it said it was the most important Again, art important. magazine in the world at the time it was so, some something like that you know yeah, but it shifted yeah. nine thousand copies i mean and what were they at that time what a fucking shilling 5p each or something yeah. um is how's it generating money? how's it making any profit you have to generate money if that's not what it's there for is exactly. it exactly that's what i'm saying but with all those editors to pay and all you know it's, it's, it's a non it's a non non-starter isn't it yeah yeah it's uh odd uh connolly was married three times uh, his first wife jane bakewell um left him in 1939. His second wife, Barbara Skelton, uh, they left in, divorced in 1950. His third wife, whom we married in 1959, was a lady called Deirdre Craven, uh, a granddaughter of James Craig, first Viscount Craig, Craig Haven, by whom he had two children later in life, including the writer, Cressida uh, Connolly, an English novelist, biographer, journalist, and critic. And... His wife, his wife was the granddaughter of James uh, Vis Viscount Craig Haven, whose wife and uh, Deidre Craven's grandmother was Cecil, called Cecil, uh, Mary Noel 
Derin Craig, Viscountess of Craighaven, DBE, who was the fourth cousin of a future Queen Mother, Elizabeth Angela Marguerite Bose Lyon. So that was the last Queen's mother, the right. one that lived up to about 190 or something. <laughs> Back to Cyril Connolly. His first wife, Barbara Skel Olive Skelton, was an English memorist, novelist, and socialite. In World War II, Skelton, who was recruited for the Foreign Office as a cyber clerk by a Soviet spy, Donald McLean, who was one of the, the, the double agents again. Skelton, who was also King Farouk's, uh, of Egypt's mistress, and she was working uh, for the Foreign Office in Egypt at that time, she became... King Farouk of Egypt's mistress by accident, Chris. Um, in April 43, Skelton replaced Irene Gwinil, or Gwinley, uh, as Farouk's official mistress. Right, you can become an official mistress. Yeah. <laughs> Is that, do think she's secret service then? Well, um, yeah. I, <laughs> I would say so. Well, yeah. she works for the Foreign Office, and she's been allowed to date um, yeah. the King of Egypt. And this was when England sort of ruled Egypt at that particular time. Yeah. Keep him in check. Um, when Connolly and Skelton married, he apparently encouraged her to go on trips with King Farouk. So this was after this time. Um, another influential person in Cyril Connolly's life was Sir Charles Otto Desmond McCarthy, or Desmond McCarthy, a descendant of the last McCarthy chief of the name and king of Desmond. The, king, the Kingdom of Desmond is an historic kingdom in southwest Ireland. McCarthy was a member of the Cambridge Apostles, the Intellectual Secret Society, from 1896. And he was also a member of the Bloomsbury Group with Earl Bertrand Russell, who was another interesting character. You know, you could have gone into all these people, Chris. Um, and when you listen, when, you, when people say Bertrand Russell, they never say Earl Bertrand Russell, do they? No, I didn't know it was an Earl. He's an earl, or he was an earl, yeah. For part of the World War, First World War, McCarthy worked in naval intelligence. Ooh, that pops up a bit. Right? Shocking horror. <laughs> <laughs> it, and it, uh, what, in 1917, he joined the New Statesman as a drama critic, and in 1920, he became its literary editor. Editor, and you see this even back going back to Johnson. Uh, yeah, that's what I was just thinking. That yeah, These, the, the, he's in naval intelligence, and he's been rewarded. A uh, new statesman, drama critic, just as a... Just plum as job. A plum job, yeah. Yeah. Um, during this time, he recruited Cyril Connolly to the paper. Connolly also shared a flat with Patrick Balfour, third baron of King Cross, King Ross, who was a Scottish historian and writer. He was also gay and a member of the extended Marcus Mac, uh, Queensbury family. So, Despite being being gay, Patrick Balfour married Angela Mary Colm Seymour, which I mean, they did in those days. That's what happened, didn't it? Um, yeah, the Barons have to share a flat. I don't know. <laughs> it sounds like tra sounds like a training ground to me. That's what it yeah, sounded yeah. like. Uh, I Just got a new flatmate, Baron. Yeah. Baron, Baron, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Baron Greenback. Uh, <laughs> men like Baron Watson, Baron Kinross, who were gay at this time, would have been very easily manipulated into security agencies. Um, who use people like that guy we mentioned earlier, Denim Fouts, as honey mm. traps. Yeah, the most expensive... Uh... Prosti male prostitute in the world. Yeah. I mean, have you ever heard that phrase I've never before? even heard that. <laughs> Where's the most expensive male prostitute now? Yeah, who is it? <laughs> <laughs> and don't send me any emails. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The before mentioned, we mentioned this guy earlier, so Stephen Harold Spender. Stephen Spender. Didn't Jimmy Neal play him? Uh, <laughs> CBE, who was linked to MI6 and then CIA, uh, was also involved with Horizon magazine. So can you remember that magazine Encounter, which mm. sounds that sound doesn't sound like an art magazine, does it? Encounter. Yeah. Um, that the, sounds... The they paint a lot of people out of those 9,000 copies. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you must be selling them for like 200 quid each. <laughs> um... If you remember, Spender was the editor of another magazine called Encounter from 1953 to 1966, but resigned after it emerged that the Congress for Cultural Freedom, that sounds like it's out in 1984, which yeah. published it, was covertly funded by the CIA. <laughs> 
two of the women at Riser magazine were second wife of Robert Anthony Eden, first Earl of Avon, also known as Prime Minister Anthony Eden. She was Anne Clarissa Eden, Countess of Avon, and her surname was a Spencer Churchill. Yeah, those Spencers. Yeah. And she was also the niece of Winston Churchill. It's starting to ring any bells, Chris. Yeah, but, I'm, I'm guessing Horizon Magazine won't, won't put won't, that exactly think it room, was, yeah. <laughs> Some of her ancestors included the wealthy Dutch family, the Van Cortland family. Ooh, David Crosby um, of Crosby, Stills and Nash was part of. And if you remember David Crosby um, from the Doors of Perception we did, yeah. is a direct descendant of King John. Well, he's massive in the, uh, what is it, hippie movement, wasn't it? Yeah. And he, 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 his ancestors probably did know Jim Morrison's ancestors, or they were even related. Right. How would that be? Two biggest hippie uh, 60s counterculture. <laughs> <laughs> we mentioned that in that uh, episode. I mean, it's yeah. pretty pretty obvious to me that. Were they doing World... the same thing back there? <laughs> yeah, maybe they were doing that, having the, using them, uh, what were they called, uh, loot, mm. and the loot instead. Um, during World War Two, Spencer Churchill... Um, this lady, who, uh, uh, Anthony Eden's wife, Spencer Churchill decoded secret ciphers in the communications department at the Foreign Office. She was also close to Soviet double agents, Donald McLean and Guy Burgess. You hear a lot of that, don't you? That the the you know certain people were um, decoders of mystical Nazi. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's banded around quite a lot, there, isn't it? It is, lot, yeah. Lot, yeah, a lot of decoders that saved. A lot the of decoders. Working for, but they still work. They're working for security department that have had to sign an official secrets act that have been watched and listened to. What happens when they leave that leave that job, um, and they're working for a magazine? Yeah, do you just do you just leave? Seems like more fluff jobs, doesn't it? Uh, yeah. Uh, the other woman at Horizon was Son Sonia Bro Brown Brownell. Uh, Brownell met author George Orwell through Horizon and later married him as his second wife, stroke handler. <laughs> um, we're, we're going to go into her in part two but it turns out that Sonia Brownell later Orwell was really the main editor another editor Remember of Horizon magazine you couldn't call it CIA monthly could you nobody would buy it <laughs> <laughs> nobody would buy into that one just about 25 editors isn't it? does anyone yeah, write anything <laughs> yeah no, nobody wrote everything just editors just loads of editors <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, I tell you, Chris, right, there was so much information here, right? This is really bullet point mm. edited out. Um, when I get round to writing my book on this, when I, <laughs> I need another editor. When I get round, I ring Sonia up. When I get round to <laughs> writing my book on this, these will have heavy detailing. Um, what I want to point out in this sort of part is how many people, and there were more, by the way, were close to Orwell with links to security agency or intelligence um, or who'd worked in secret ciphering, then happened to work at a magazine that, with a guy that was funded in another magazine by CIA. You know, it, it's... I mean, was that magazine just... Went the a, Prime Minister, you know? <laughs> was that magazine just a meet-up place for other things? Do you know what I mean? Well, I think, like you've said many times, that art, you know, um, has been yeah. pushed as some kind of... I don't know. Again, it's uh, twilight, uh, twilight language, isn't it? And like yeah. everything, the surface level is people make a shitload of money out of it. Mm. Um, you know, like you, let, you let other people make a shitload of money out of it, but then the ultimate thing is other things, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. There's always multiple reasons for these things, isn't there? Yeah. Well, the, again, like uh, Laurel Canyon, they're replacing, and I forgot the name of it, but they're replacing London, where all these writers um, lived and worked there. And it was a strange, like, like the Bloomsbury group, where they all sort of met up at just you know, a just popped in my head as well. Do you uh, remember you talked about the Wedgwoods? Mm. And then you think, is it, is it, a, I mean, this is, I'm just talking out loud here, but thinking out loud, sorry. But like Stoke-on-Trent was like the, the place of pottery in England. Yeah. Now it didn't sound like anything to us, but pottery was massive at that period of time. Yeah, yeah. Sheffield was massive for steel. Was yeah. it, do you know what I mean? Uddersfield was massive for wool, Cot wasn't it? Yeah, wool, yeah. Wool and uh, cotton, was it? Yeah, wool. well, cotton were in Lancashire, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. But I mean, they always said the reason it was in Lancashire because it was a damp atmosphere and cotton, you know, blah, blah. 
uh, just, make again, it again, with these same things going on there, fight were they? Were they the early <laughs> Laurel Canyons? You know, quite possibly. Yeah, yeah. you know, pottery in the Wedgwoods in Stoke. Yeah, well, with the more clay in Stoke. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, Sheffield Steel. I mean, yeah, no, 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 Sheff- just, there were no steel mines in Sheffield. No, or I didn't but see. What I mean is, it just it just smells smells of that more gangsterism, doesn't it? The more yeah. you think about it. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, more gangsterism. You have that. I'll have that. We'll divide up this and that. You know, like when 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 you, like the Fritz Brimmeyer, where they divide out in America, in New America, like you, mm. one gets one family gets a fur trade, and you should be like gets... the Hessian. You get the Hessian. Uh, you yeah. get you know with that type of yeah. thing in them. You days, get the fur right? trade. We get the dynamite trade. You get that. Da, da, da. Yeah, divvying it all out. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. No, it's true. It's, it, <laughs> yeah, and then uh, uh, George Orwell, you write a story about it. Because Every base covered. We've got the to art base covered. We've got the story base covered. Exactly. The magazine base covered. Yeah. So basically, Bring another book out because we need to tweak that story now. Yeah. So basically, secret services are ruining the country. Yeah. <laughs> for the for the machine. For the for the betterment of British people. Mm. <laughs> all, 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 yeah, for, for our own protection. Orwell met his first wife, psychologist Eileen O'Shaughnessy, in the spring of 1935. We, we we stumbled across this type of connection where a lot of these famous people, like, well, the two people we're talking about, um, Aldous Huxley and uh, Orwell, the, their wives, I think it was Huxley's second wife and Orwell's first wife, were psychologists. Yeah. <laughs> then you've got Paul McCartney living with um, a girl whose father was into mind control. I'm going to come on to that in a bit in, a, in episode two. Um, because I stumbled across that that links to this. How mad is that? Um, uh, yeah. So a lot of these people are working with psych. There's, there's so many different links into these things. Where, like we said earlier, Lucian Freud. Lucian Freud. Yeah. His granddad was the daddy. The daddy. Yeah. The the inventor of modern psychology. Yeah. At the time, Orwell was living at seventy seven Parliament Hill in Hampstead. There's one of those blue plaques on the wall telling us how important it was from the building. <laughs> <laughs> he was occupying a spare room in the first floor flat owned by Rosalind Henschel Obermeyer. Obermeyer was the niece of Sir George Henschel, um, who was Sir Isidore George Henschel, a German-born British baritone, pianist, conductor, composer, and academic teacher, He was also the founder and conductor of the London Symphony Concerts. I mean, these people are writing history as we're going here, aren't we? Mm. And so George Henschel was also a friend of married mother of two, Mabel Sinclair Furs, with whom Orwell had an affair. Where have we heard that name Sinclair before? Ah, yeah, Sinclairs. Um, We're related to Orwell (laughs) via Lady Mary Fane, Orwell's great-great-grandmother via the Earl of Westmoreland. We're going to come on to that in episode two because there's some right genealogy going on there. Um, got me a bit excited, did that genealogy. Kept me up one Sunday night um, <laughs> when I found that out. <laughs> I, could, I couldn't go to sleep that night. Um, get out more fire. Yeah, I do need to get out more, you're right. Um, Cyril Vernon Connolly uh, had many interesting contacts, as we just mentioned a few uh earlier, which make him the possible security agent. But what does that make George Orwell? Some of his contacts, friends, acquaintances, mentors, were people like before mentioned Cecil Walter Hardy Beaton, Sir Cecil Ward Hardy Beaton, CBE, who was an admirer of Horizon magazine, <laughs> funder and art collector Peter uh, Peter Watson, or Baron, or Sir Peter Watson. That Horizon magazine must have been some read, man. <laughs> it must have been really exciting. Um, yeah. It, but th- this guy, right, this beaten guy, right, he was, he took the pictures, uh, he was like the royal photographer. Right. Yeah, and, and he won an Oscar, uh, winning stage and costume designer for films and theatre. Right. Yes, yeah. Another one of them guys just got yeah. handed everything. Right, looks of it. The, the Queen recommended Beaton to the Ministry of Information. Right. right? Cyril, Cyril Connolly had previously collaborated with Ian Fleming in 1952 in writing an account of the Cambridge Five Spies 
In the 1950s entitled The Missing Diplomat, an early publication for Fleming's Queen Anne Press. Ian Fleming came from a wealthy family connected to Merchant Bank, Robert Fleming and Co. It was sold to Chase Manhattan for $7.7 billion in 2000. Right. In, in May 1939, Fleming was recruited by Rear Admiral John Godfrey, Director of Naval Intelligence of the Royal Navy, to become his personal assistant. Fleming was involved in the planning operations for Operation Goldeneye right. and, and in the planning and oversight of two intelligence units, 30 Assault Unit and the T-Force. What's, what's that? What's T-Force? They were like the, the assault unit. They were used them in, I think it was Norway, the commandos. Uh, all right, like a, <clears throat> an elite force. Yeah, like similar to the SAS type thing. Right, yeah. It, an interesting Fleming story, and these are the type of stories that just you've got to f- dig around to find. Um, in 1927, well, I'll start the scene. Fleming was a bit of a playboy at, at school. I think he, he went to Eton, and then he went to Oxford, I believe. And his teacher said to his mother, or his the, the headmaster or whatever, so you need to get him out of here because he's not, you know, blah, blah. So in 1927, to prepare Fleming for a possible entry into the foreign office, MI5, his mother sent him to the Tenerhof in Kitzbühel, Austria, a small private school run by the Alderian Aldel- discipline, disciple, sorry, run by the Alderian disciple and former British spy, Earn and Forbes Dennis, and his novelist wife, Phyllis Bottom, with an E. Earn and Forbes Dennis, a British diplomat, working firstly in Marseille and then in Vienna as a passport control officer, which was a cover for his real role as MI6 head of station, with the responsibility for Austria, Hungary and Yugoslavia. Phyllis Bottom studied individual psychology under Alfred Adler while in Vienna. In 1960, Fleming wrote to Phyllis Bottom, my life with you both is one of my most cherished memories and heaven knows where I should be today without earning. What was going on there then? Sounds like an MK Ultra operation to me. <coughs> Chris. Strange. Uh, maybe you were questioning what he was doing. I don't know. But uh... Fleming, that Fleming, sto- that old Fleming story is a weird story, isn't it? I mean, and like now, the most imp- apparently the most important thing that can ever happen in England other than sausage fingers doing whatever, <laughs> is when a fucking Bond film comes out. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I know. Uh, you know Who's yeah. going to play James? Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Who gives a shit? It should be a black guy. It should be a should tranny. Be, should, should be a, a woman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> should be an alien with tits. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think... Yeah. Well, again, entertainment takes his mind off what it is, just another mind control in it. Mm. Who should play James Bond? Who's your favourite James Bond? Which were your favourite James Bond car? Who's the best James Bond baddie? Yeah. Who's and singing James Bond theme tune? <laughs> I mean, it could be on and on and on. <laughs> Shirley Bassey were best. No, it won't. It were Madonna's. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And they're all, all the films are mediocre at best. Yes. Yeah. Let's be honest. As much yeah. as you want, you want to like them. I mean, when I used to, yeah, I used to want to like them, but they're always mediocre at best. Yeah. And they're always on at Christmas again, that other yeah. people watch them. It's yeah. over and over again. Seems yeah. to go on all fucking afternoon. Working with Fleming brought Connolly into contact with others he respected, including Nico Davis, a.k.a. Ni- Nicholas Nico Llewellyn Davis. He was one of the youngest of the Llewellyn Davis boys, who were the inspiration for Jane Barry's, a.k.a. Sir James Matthew Barry, first baronet. Barry was the author of Peter Pan and the, and the Lost Boys. So the, he was one of the inspirations for Peter Pan. That's another, it's another one. Do you know what? There's a new Peter Pan film out. Um, I think it's on Disney. And it's another one of them that's dragged out over and over and over again, isn't it? Mm. Why? I mean, do you know, I had an interesting, I don't know if I told you this, but I had an interesting take on Peter Pan. And it is the fact, because in, in Peter Pan world, they're all young lads, aren't they? Mm. And apparently, I don't know this for a fact, but in the novel, when the young Lost Boys become too old, Peter Pan gets rid of them. Or, or I don't know if he kills them or gets rid of them. So one of the theories was that, you know, the uh, Captain Hook and all these pirates, yep. they're actually ex-Lost Boys that Peter Pan got rid of. Ah, right. So yeah. that's why they want revenge on Peter Pan. Right. So Peter Pan's a baddie, really? 
Yeah. That's, that's, Would that, that surprise would... you, that double well, speak, well, twilight he, language, he, he turns up, He turns up at kids' houses and snatches them out of the fucking bedroom. Monsters, Inc. Yeah. And then um, old Captain Oak wants to kill, get Peter Pan. But it's yeah. because he's he's disgruntled because he got him out of his bedroom when he was a kid. <laughs> and he wants revenge, yeah. basically. Um, so he doesn't hate the, the kids. He just hates Peter Pan. And Peter Pan's a bad guy. Interesting take on it. Interesting version of events. But again, why is, why is Alice in Wonderland, Peter Pan, these same stories told to us over and over again? There's a, there's a reason, isn't there? Um, yeah, generation after generation as well. Generation after generation. Can I just come up with a new story? We well, again, to, as, we really as, need another film version of Peter Pan. As we'll get into with Lewis Carroll, you know, Lewis Carroll will link to the Huxleys mm-hmm. via their mother. Well, I'm saying the Huxleys. Julia, uh, Julia Arnold Huxley mother of uh, Aldous and Julian Huxley. Mm. Um, she was photographed, her and her sister, when they were young, g- really young girls, by Lewis Carroll. Yeah, yeah. And and he's, I think it's quite pretty obvious that he was something he shouldn't have been. Uh, yeah. With He was photographing a lot of young young girls. Um, in fact, some of them wouldn't allow their kids to be around him. Right, well, that has to tell you something, doesn't it? We'll go, we'll go, we'll go into that in... Some detail in in that epi- that be a few episodes on, but um, it is. Uh, but but when you think of the background to these books, Chris, where the writing it, but these people are uh, odd. Let's just say the least. It's a bit like Jimmy Savile in it. He's on prime time, prime time. Jim will fix mm. it. Jim will fix yeah. it. And yet behind the scenes, mm. was it even a fact that um, paedophilia weren't on anyone's radar at all? I mean, there were maybe homosexuality was, but. Was it not in anyone's radar? Even a little bit. I don't know. I, don't, I, don't, I mean, I can't go, but a lot of people say, well, it were innocent times back then, you know, when they were first taking pictures and stuff well, like it worked, that. It was just easier to get away with. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now innocent. there's pictures there and they're still doing the same behaviour, but they're having the picture taken going, oh, shit, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Cyril Connolly was also friends with Lord Dunglass, better known as Prime Minister Alec Douglas Home, whose wife was Elizabeth Hester Arlington, daughter of George Littleton, 4th Baron Littleton, chaplain for George V. Interestingly, Tinker Taylor Soldier Spy, author John Le Carre, and his novelisation of his experiences of the revelations in the 50s and 60s, which exposed the Cambridge Five traitors. John Le Carre was signed to Orwell's publisher, Secker and Warburg, owned by John Frederick Warburg, member of the Committee of the Social Society for Social Freedom that was funded by the CIA. <laughs> And also, when you think of John Le Carre, um, and you think we mentioned him in the first in first yeah. part of this, didn't we? But go on. But no, no I was just going to say, but Tinker Taylor Soldier is just selling the Cold War story. Isn't mm. it? I might have said mm. that before. I can't but it's selling. He didn't. He's selling the Cold War story as again the heroes are. Mm. If you British. notice, it sells both sides pretty equally throughout yeah. these books. But then there's always a slam dunk that the West right. Yeah. And actually, when you analyse these books as well, and you you know step back away from them, they're fighting over nothing. Yes, nothing's actually happening. Nothing's happening. Hence, nothing. why it's a Cold War. Cold War. Um, yeah, I did read the spy that came in from the call. That war, that I've read a few John Le Carre's. That was my favourite. I thought it was like like a lot of these books, like a lot of films. The good actors, mm-hmm. the good script writers. I mean, I, I wouldn't I say so now. The modern stuff, but going back in time, uh, the scripts, the acting. The yeah. books, all the, they were very well written books. Gary Ullman Spare. did a good job of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He did a very I mean, good. Then he went to play well Churchill, which put me off. Well, him again, altogether. does he know that he's selling an agenda? I, I don't know. Maybe he doesn't. Yeah. Um, Quite well, he doesn't do that. Otherwise, he wouldn't have played it. Um, you'd like you'd like to say that he doesn't because. Uh, I'm sure you quite like it, Gary Ullman. I do. As well. Yeah, I do. <laughs> well, he's yeah, probably another one. Again, know. one of these rebellious people who you think's rebellious aren't that rebellious, are Chris? No, we have to leave that for. There's no rebels like in Hollywood. There's and no rebels in Hollywood fight. No, <laughs> no, they're in. As we found out in 2020, at Eton, Orwell took classes from Aldous Huxley. Orwell noted that he and his contemporaries appreciated Huxley's linguistic flair. Orwell was at Eton with Sir James Cochrane Stevenson Runciman, known as Stephen Runciman. He was the second son of Walter Runciman, first Viscount Runciman of Doxford. What are Runciman's there? And Hilda Runciman, Viscountess of Doxford. Stephen Runciman was a King's Scholar at Eton and a close friend of Orwell's. After receiving a large inheritance from his grandfather, Runciman became 
press attaché at the British legation in the Bel Bulgarian capital, Sofia, in 1940, and at the em British embassy in Cairo in 1941. From 1945 to 47, he was a representative in Athens of the British Council, which is part of the Foreign Office, MI5, MI6, pushing the cultural beliefs of the UK on foreign countries. If you remember, Chris Whitty's father worked for mm. that. He's got, I think he's got a £3 billion um, annual budget. Right. A serious clout to push around every year. Mm -hmm. um, and Chris Whitty's dad worked there. Uh, he was killed in Athens while working yeah. for the British Council, mistaken for an MI6 no. agent. No, he worked in the Ford Escort. New, he was buying a new Ford Escort. Then, yeah, so. <laughs> from Auto Trader, from Auto buying, Trader Athens. Uh, buying a Canary bus. Yellow Ford Escort. <laughs> yeah, Canary Yellow did stand out in the crowd. Uh -huh. yeah. During the early Cold War, an important department was the Informa Information Research Department, set up to counter Soviet propaganda and infiltration. Who we'll worked there again? Ah, oh, well. Do you know? Fact, it's amazing when you think about it, right? You know, we talk about the Cold War. All these intelligence depart no one's if everyone were just left Lack alone of intelligence <laughs> yeah that we have no intelligence yeah. but but if everyone were just left alone nothing had happened would it these mm -hmm. warring factions in countries do you know anyone who wants to go and fucking start spying I mean, on everybody if, if anyone's guilty of anything it's wanting to earn a bit of cash or whatever but it's just all this stuff's created all this mi you know secret just, says, cia it's just all made up isn't it but but also if you think about it they used to say oh, it's KGB listen to everybody in the flats and stuff like this. You can't, yeah, yeah. You can't KGB, fight without knowing that. Yeah, yeah. KGB are evil. CIA and MI6 are fine. Yeah, they're fine. They just kill their own uh, members of their own public. <laughs> but they do it in a nice way, Chris. Yeah, yeah, they do. Yeah, yeah. Strangle them nice a velvet cloth. <laughs> yeah, they put them in a they put them in a Adidas hold all in bath, wipe all fingerprints away. Yeah. <laughs> do it in a nice way. Yeah. <laughs> um, fucking mental, it? Yeah, it absolutely. Mean? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I mean, all will work for the IRD. Um, and we'll go into that as well. Uh, and in this era, we know that British, the British aristocracy were used to work for the intelligence communities. Yeah. They, in, when there were diplomats and things like that, like this guy, who were one of his best mates. I'm going to tell you this weird story that came across with um, Runciman, which adds a different uh, dynamic to what we think of Orwell. Yeah. Yeah. Now, in his personal life, Runciman... Uh, was an old-fashioned English eccentric known, and, and a story from his time at Eton uh, of an incident with his good friend George Orwell. And this story was told by, or told in Gordon uh, Bowker's biography of Orwell. Bowker reveals, reveals the fascination of or Orwell with the occult. And here's, here's the story. A, a, senior, a story of a senior boy called Philip York who had attracted the disfavour of both Orwell and Runciman, so they planned a revenge. This is from the book, this. As Runciman recalled, they fashioned an image of York from candle wax and broke off a leg. To their horror, shortly afterwards, York not only broke his leg, but in July died of leukaemia. Well, yeah. Hmm. It's got a bit of everything in this, Chris. <laughs> yeah. Uh, nice big melting pot. Yeah. Run Runciman was also uh, homosexual. I would say, out of most of the people that I looked into um, mm. in this, uh, I'd say about f a lot, border on 50%, but I've never done research where th this has happened, where mo a large chunk of the people were gay. Mm. Male males as well. I'm not saying they weren't female. And well, the I females suppose, were feminists. I suppose you're dipping into the art world, I suppose, a bit more, authors yeah. and stuff. And Maybe, yeah. You know, I don't know. I mean, this Runciman were a, quite an Italy. He's got streets named after him in Greece and Bulgaria. Do you think that were Orwell's boyfriend then? I don't know. Um, I don't know. There's a lot of bisexuals floating about here, Chris. Uh, is that is that the secret club where they've got to do these acts even if they aren't gay? Well, well also in them days, you would have you if you were homosexual, even if you were known in the homosexual sect, you would have had mm. a wife as a, to cover it. Cover, you were homosexual. Yeah. yeah. And maybe um, they all understand and all agree upon it. You know. Yeah, maybe. Um, Maybe. Another interesting fact about the Runciman family is that they're from the northeast of England, South Shields to be exact. And that is exactly where Orwell's first wife, Eileen O'Shaughnessy, was from, the psychologist. Right. She actually died unexpectedly up there as well. Um, 
after an operation, apparently uh, under anaesthetic. Right. Can happen, but tell yeah. me, don't you? <laughs> yeah. Uh, surely, you, young lady. Um, Orwell, as I mentioned earlier, was tutored at Eton by ASF Gao, who probably was the person to advise Orwell to join the Indian police force and not go to Oxford. Gao was a fellow at the tr of the Trinity College, Cambridge, uh, who also gave him advice later in his career. One story is that George Orwell was serving at the time in the Indian Imperial Police in Burma uh, from 27th of November 1922 to 12th of July 1927. So he'd been there quite a while, as I said earlier, mm. formally resigning while on leave in England. Orwell is documented to have consulted Gao in 1927 when he was planning to become a writer and maintained a lot of contact with him. Um, so Gao apparently advised him to come out, well, whether it were advice or your next job, your next mission is this. Um, <laughs> your, your tape recorder will destroy itself in five seconds. Five seconds, yeah. <laughs> uh, Gao was named as one of the uh, Cambridge Five Super Spooks on the 20th of October 2012 by Brian Sewell who suggested that Gao may have been the fifth man and spymaster of the Cambridge Five. Gao is thought to have been an MI5 recruiter. In an article I read, it said that ASF Gao, Orwell's Eaton tutor, was, the MI, was his MI5 recruiter. Instead of going on to University of Oxbridge, Orwell instead joined the Indian Imperial Police Force. <clears throat> was the IIP a training ground for MI5? Is Gao... Um... What's his name then? Smiley. Out of... Well, it's, do you know, it sounds like Smiley, doesn't it? But yeah, yeah. He, um, he again, he. Smiley. He eat, they eat, Smiley. Eat. Smiley, Jesus. <laughs> Smiley face. <laughs> yeah. Smiley's people. S Smiley. Sent, uh, Smiley's people, yeah. Yeah. Sent a is, that, that's, me, yeah. Is, that, is that the, is that the um, character that. What's his name played? Yeah. Uh, Gary Oldman. Gary Oldman. That was, yeah. He was Smiley, wasn't he? Yeah, and somebody Smiley's, else. Smiley's in all. Well, Alec Guinness played yeah. it. Somebody else sent a thing in the the bag that the guy were walking around with in Utopia. Mm. I sent a picture in. A that smiley was face a smiley face bag, right? That he used to get his weapons out of. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd, to, I'd like to watch that again. We said, we got a lot of smiley face stuff sent in after that first one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, smiley's people. Jesus. Yeah. yeah. So. One interesting thing is, so the question is, was the Indian uh, police uh, a training ground for MI5? Andrew Sidham, Sidham Farah Gao, also known as ASF Gao, he never married, nor did his friend A.E. Hausman, an English classical scholar and poet, appointed professor of Latin at University College London, the USL, and then at University of Cambridge. Just to finish this part of the... Indian Imperial Police links to MI5. Sir David Petre served in the Indian Imperial Police from 1900 to 1936. Sir David Petre worked uh, and worked in the police, serving in a variety of police intelligence roles. He headed up the Delhi Intelligence Bureau and the Indian Police uh, and served as chairman of the Indian Public Service Commission until 1936. He joined the Army Intelligence Corps after the outbreak of World War II. Sir David Petrie was the Director General of MI5 from 1941 to 1946. Just going back to this character, Brian Sewell, who named uh, that Gao guy as the head of the Cambridge, Cambridge Five spy ring. Brian Sewell was the man who hid Blunt in 1979 after Blunt's exposure as the fourth man in the Cambridge spy ring. Sewell was also an English art critic. Sewell wrote for the Evening Standard. The Guardian described him as Britain's most famous and controversial art critic, while the Standard called him the nation's best art critic. Sewell claimed that his father was the British composer and music critic Philip Arnold Heseltine, known by the pseudonym of Peter Warlock. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's always dragged out. I, do you know what? I just looked... A picture of Brian Sewell. He's always dragged out as the art critic, you know. I mean, I don't know him. Do you know him? Have you? Yeah, yeah. Heard of him? Yeah, I do. And I'm just looking at a picture of him. I reckon <coughs> he died. He died. He's, de he's dead now, isn't he? Yeah. Um, I reckon I recognise the name. Then looked at a picture of him. Yeah, he was always dragged out as like the um, British art critic on you know BBC Two when I used to watch it and think it was important. Right. Well, yeah. you, we're on BBC. Worry, was that in, 
Yeah, but, I think that's him. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's him. Brian Sewell. Yeah. You know, you, you start looking Brent at this person. Sewell. I know uh, Mark Devlin and Mike William and Crow and all these. And I know we've said this and many people listening will say this, but everything you see now is an operation in it. Yeah. Well, I'm looking at pictures here for of Brian Sewell and I recognise the old Brian Sewell. But then there's young, the younger ones of him, you know, in a polar neck jumper, looking yeah. all art criticy. And then, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's, 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 yeah, he's been dragged out forever. That guy as uh, the art critic. Yeah, they uh, love it uh, as well, don't they? Look at the pictures of him. You know, yeah, they love it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They, they have the certain look as well. He's like yeah. the playing a character, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah literally, literally, where literally where it, where like a character. character. Yeah. Yeah. But his, his, his dad, or we said his was his dad, was called Peter Warlock. Right, nice. The Warlock That's name superior. reflects. The, but the what the warlock name reflects his dad's interest in dark occult practices and was the name used for all his publish, published musical works. Right. Brian Sewell came out as bisexual in 2007. His father, Peter Warlock, was also gay <laughs> or bisexual. I know. Um, Sewell indicates that he lost his virginity age 15 to a fellow pupil at Ed Abba, Abba Dasher's Ask School. Sewell claimed to have slept with over 1,000 men. What? Is he uh, Britain's most expensive prostitute? It, it might... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say what I'm going to say then. <laughs> a bottom like a windsock. Uh, <laughs> Double agent with Blunt, who Sewell hid, was also gay. As I said, as a merry, many of these characters of question, um, bisexual or gay, the, and the question is, was Orwell? Yeah, he was surrounded by a lot of these people. Yeah, we're married twice. We understand that, but um, when he sees relationships, you have to ask um, questions about these relationships because his first wife had an affair. Apparently, they had an open marriage. Mm. Like that happened in the thirties, forties, whenever it was. Yeah, they had an open marriage, um, and he had an affair. She had an affair while she were in they were in the Spanish Civil War, and right. he, he were best mates with a guy, and they never fell out or anything like that. Right. Um, a bit strange story, which we'll come on to again. Also, the big question is now that the intelligence service services were running, funding, and recruiting writers, publishers. Etc. It seems everything we know is controlled via the system. So every magazine you get, every well, I mean, to be fair, for it, it's become even more evident now mm. that everything's controlled. Like I said, from TV, news, everything, uh, Netflix, everything. To me, I get the Empire magazine every month. That's controlled mm. all through the previous nonsense over the last few years. All the directors. Well, if it's got Tom Hanks in, it's controlled. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Got, the, the, everyone's wearing face snappers, and every you know, when it shows a director, all, yeah. um, you know, a few photos from a film that they're making, they're all face snapping up. Even now, actually, right. even now when it's not even a thing, still doing it. You know what I mean? They're still selling the narrative. You'd think they'd want to sell the other narrative, wouldn't you? It's well, every every sell... in, every interview. What did you do during the nonsense? Yeah. Oh, I'm just getting back to work now. After the non, you know, they're all yeah, mentioning yeah. it, but in yeah. that kind of way, no questioning. Yeah. No question. That, that's yeah. just a magazine. So, I mean, if they're doing that now with modern day magazines, and I pick up <laughs> my missus's girls' magazines occasionally, definitely selling the narrative. Yeah. So, the infiltration now is, uh, yeah, full on. Yeah. More so than it was then. And yeah. probably the easier to hide then. Mm. So, what, one interesting uh, character that um, Orwell met before he was famous um, was a lady called. Mabel uh, for Fires or Fears, um, F A E R Z. Uh, jo Orwell was twenty-seven uh, when he met her, and she, she was she was forty. Uh, and this was in the summer of nineteen thirty, on a beach in Southold, um, where the amateur watercolorist Orwell, so he was also an amateur watercolorist, set up his easel. That's near here, Southold. I've been there. Right. Yeah. Where Edmund Beers from? Right, right. According to an article I saw on Sotheby's.com, it was an unlikely relationship. Mabel, out walking with her husband Francis, was 13 years older than the young man whom she now engaged in conversation on the Suffolk Strand. She was married and had two pre-teenage children. 
Orwell was an aspiring writer, I thought he was a watercolorist, in his late 20s, more or less penniless, more or less, and highly uncertain, or with highly uncertain prospects. I'd hazard a guess, he had no, if it were real, he had no prospect and he was skint. Boll- that's bollocks, that's a bollocks story. Yeah. It even yeah. sound real. <laughs> Eric Blair's chance encounter in Southworld with M- Mabel Fears led to the transformation of his literary career. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> Started writing his books in a garage, did he? Yeah, yeah. No, he were on the beach. Right. He were a watercolorist. Well, he was watercolorist. Yeah. <laughs> Never mentioned ever that he was an artist in any form. And now he's a watercolorist. <laughs> <laughs> but this brief encounter on the beach soon established that Orwell and Mrs. Fears, who described herself as a restless woman, uh, had interests in common. Yeah, bet they did. Both of them were associated associated with a small circulation, um, but ferociously highbrow monthly magazine called The Adelphi. Another magazine, Chris. Uh, fucking magazines galore. Yeah. According to her own account, Orwell had lately taken up watercolour painting as a recreation. He was working on an easel in Southwell Beach, this is what she's saying now, when she engaged in passing conversation with him. On leaving Southwell that summer, Mabel offered an open invitation to Eric to use the Fritz's house whenever he needed to stay in London. Right, there you go. Of course you do. You bump into a guy on a beach. Yeah. Just come and stay at my house whenever you want. It's fine. Hello, penniless watercolourist. Um, <laughs> yeah. What else do you do? Well, I can write good stories. I write a couple right. of stories. You can use our London house if you want. Yeah, stay there whenever yeah. you want. Stay there, peasant. No problem. Yeah. No. yeah. yeah. <laughs> don't nick any at booze. No, don't nick any at booze. <laughs> don't smoke any of his fags. And don't like pull any Ukrainian. floorboards up. Yeah. Like a Ukrainian. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just, just go there and just, yeah, relax. Open and... invitation, Chris, to stay just at drop, their you house can, in You can London. paint and write what you want. Yeah. No problem. It's for, Orwell's first book, Down and Out, in Paris and London, uh, was rejected three times. Mabel's husband, Francis, had a friend who was a literary agent. He was called Leonard Moore. Moore thought there was no hope, as nobody knew this young writer. Well, if you're reading, you, you, nobody does know. Maybe he got him to take his tramp clothes off and put a suit on. Yeah, and stop watercolouring. <laughs> um, but then he reread, he reread the work properly, Chris. Right, right. And in April 1932, he agreed to act for Eric. Right. Yeah. By the end of June 1932, so we're talking what, one, two months. Moore informed him that the firm of Victor Galantz was prepared to publish his work with an advance of £40. This kick-started Orwell's literary career. A chance meeting on a beach, watercolouring. Again, it, make, it does make you wonder, you know, in this crazy world, was he told to go and paint a picture on a beach? Uh, or or was it, is it totally made up? Or what was that? Was that? The follow the woman in the red polka dot dress. You yeah. know what I mean? Is yeah. it that? I don't know. Yeah. Who knows? It's definitely a medicine. If I went and painted a picture on um in middle of, in in middle in, of Cambridge, right? Yeah. No one had ever fucking know I did it. No. It'd just no. be gone. You yeah. Know? Why? Yeah. Why the fact that he did it at that moment in time then becomes legend? It's because it's made up. Yeah. The pseudonym of George Orwell was apparently used for down and out in Paris and London, primarily as a way of sparing his parents' embarrassment at the seedy and sexually explicit content of the work. Right. I think the Orwell the Orwell part, apparently, so he says, comes from the River Orwell. Right. Right. I, don't know. I forget where this, the George part comes from, but Orwell undertook investigative, investigative tramping expeditions in and around London collecting material for use in his first published essay, The Spike, published in the Adelphi magazine, a socialist monthly magazine journal in 1931. Oh, well, to be fair, that, 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 that could, I mean, that could explain what he was doing, pretending to be a tramp. Does that explain down and out in Paris and London? That he was, you know what I mean, investigative journalism? Well, let's see if you still think that in a minute. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the, the the spike um, was turned down. Well, not turned down. The Adelphi said he had to he had to edit and edit and edit it to get it right. 
right. which already says to me, stinks your shit. I, if you're telling a true story, all right, you've got to do some tidying up, but it's tidying up. It's not editing. Um, but there were some major edits on it, apparently, before they got right. it right. Um, but anyway, were these clandestine uh, undercover operations where he were... Bear in mind, he's, he's working for the Information Research Develop Department further on, telling people who communist, communists are. He's, a, he's fighting the Spanish Civil War as a pro-communist anti-fascist, and then the communists are apparently after him and want to kill him. Um, I guess I judge. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. Another, uh, his first pub when he published his spike, uh, this when he was writing the book, The Down and Out in Paris and London, when he was tramping in Paris and washing up in them kitchens, mm. he was funded by his aunt Nelly Limousin, who lived in Paris at the time, and she gave him social and, when necessary, financial support. So, he wasn't really tramping, were he? I would guess he's staying at Nelly's house and he's working one or two shifts in a kitchen maybe i think that's more like the reality yeah, of experiencing it, it more than experience it yeah. so some posh kid turns up and goes i'm just gonna work for a couple of <laughs> yeah, <laughs> is, yeah. That, is, that, is that is that more the reality of that well another financial contributor to orwell was british novelist leo myers named after his godfather prince leopold duke of albany the eighth child and youngest son of queen victoria and prince albert of the house of Saxe coburg and gotha he gave money or loaned money to Orwell in 1938 to convalesce from tuberculosis in Morocco. All right, right. I see what you meant there. <laughs> <laughs> Leo, Myers, Leo Myers committed suicide on 7th of April 1944 by taking an overdose of Veronal, which was a barbiturate. Right. The Adelphi or New Adelphi, um, the magazine I mentioned, was an English literary journal magazine founded by John Middleton Murray, published between 1923 and 1955. Murray was the editor until 1930, when he handed over the reins to Sir Richard Rees. Sir Richard Lodwick Edward Montague Rees, second baronet, was a British diplomat, stroke spy, writer, humanitarian, and painter. I wonder if he were a watercolourist. Uh, <laughs> Rees was the son of Sir John Rees, first baron, and his wife, Mary Catherine Dormer. His sister was pilot Rosemary Rees, Lady Ducroix, MBE, and British, a British aviator who worked for the Air Transport Auxiliary. She was second in command to Margot Gore at the Humble at Hamble during World War II. Rees was, as I said, Rees was the son of Sir John Rees, first baron, who was a colonial administrator in British India and an MP, who joined the Indian Civil Service in 1875. His knighthoods were, his knighthoods were the most eminent order of the Indian Empire and the Royal Victorian Order. I've got a feeling that Sir John Rees, first baronet, knew of Orwell's father, Richard Walmansley Blair, who worked for worked as the sub-deputy opium agent in the opium department of the Indian Civil Service, overseeing the production and storage of opium for sale to China. Where they are. East India Company. The opium department. Any way back to, to his son, Richard, Sir Richard Lodwick, uh, Edward Montague Rees, second baronet, who was a British diplomat as well. These were the type of people who worked for intelligence services. Rees would be a prime prime candidate, wouldn't he? And he, Rees was also involved in Orwell's life later on, to the point that he would become his literary executor of George Orwell's will and work after Orwell died, if he died. There's a lot of stuff we'll pick up in episode two. Even more interesting, another connection to the Huxleys. Is this the same Adelphi as the Adelphi Genetics Forum? A non-profit learned society based in the United Kingdom. Its aims are to promote the public understanding of human hereditary and to facilitate, facilitate informed debate about the ethical use raised by advances in reproductive technology. It was founded by... Sybil Gotto OBE in 1907 as the Eugenics Education Society with the aim of promoting the research and understanding of eugenics. Gotto has been described as a feminist and eugenicist. Sybil Gotto, uh, which was a name from her first marriage, was born Sybil Catherine Burney 
She was the daughter of Admiral of the Fleet, Sir Cecil Burney, First Baronet, and Lucinda Marion Burney. Sybil Gotto's second married name was Sybil Neville Rolfe, also known as Commander Neville Rolfe. Her brother was Sir Charles Dunniston Burney, Second Baronet. Members of the Eugenics Education Society came predominantly from the professional class and included eminent scientists such as Francis Galton, who was related to the Huxleys. The society engaged in advocacy and research to further their eugenic goals, and members participated in activities such as lobbying Parliament, organising lectures, and producing propaganda. Right out there, just telling you. <laughs> just telling you out there, yeah. It became the Eugenics Society in 1924. The society was renamed the Galton Institute in 1989, after Francis Galton, and from 1909 to 1968, published the Eugenics Review, a scientific journal dedicated to eugenics. Isn't that literally what Hitler based his entire theory on, the Eugenics Society, in 1924? I believe so, yes. I believe so, yeah. In 1921, it was renamed the Adelphi Genetics Forum. The, the Huxleys are married into the Galtons, the Darwins, etc., Prominent members included Neville Chamberlain, British Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, British Prime Minister, Honorary Vice President Havelock Ellis, sex therapist we mentioned in episode one. Another Honorary Vice President was Francis Galton. Margaret Sanger, who established Planned Parenthood, Federation of America, by the Rockefellers. Mm. Past Eugenic Society President included Leonard Darwin, English politician, economist and eugenicist, it's a proper mix, that, isn't it? That's what you want to be. I'm an economist <laughs> and a eugenicist. He was the son of Charles Darwin. Other presidents include Charles Galton Darwin, grandson of Charles Darwin. And finally, Sir Julian Huxley, vice president, 1937, 1944, during the war years. What better thing to be than vice president of the Eugenic Society, Chris? He was also a president, 1959 to 1962, Sir Julian Huxley. We're seeing a pattern here, Chris. Uh, the zeros and ones of the matrix. I have to say that that's brilliant. That fight that came to <clears throat> came to a conclusion there. To be yeah, fair. we're ne we're nearing the end of uh, episode no, I mean, four. I mean, no, what I mean is that I'm not saying it came to a conclusion. All that background at the beginning <clears throat> gelled together. You even meant the yeah. You even just it all just came together, didn't it? it? It's mad how it just falls through the yeah. sieve. Um, yeah, if you like, it all comes back to the same thing eugenics. Eugenics, um, we'd be mass <clears throat> eugenicized if that's a propagandized word. eugenicized, which leads us up to 2023. Yes, leads us up to 2023. Um, some interesting stuff in the next one, although this has been interesting for me. This is again, we're going to be pushing probably three hours. I know I was going about time. <laughs> this is really, I think I had all those editors from uh, Encounter, Horizon, uh, Delphi magazines editing this down because this could have been literally 10 episodes of its own. Because mm. them, even them Cambridge spies deserved yeah. um, a full yeah. thing. The, 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 that was an interesting story in itself, especially when you've got John Le Carre writing the full story about it. Well, him. maybe we should get through this and do a John Le Carre bit. Um, maybe. Um, because he's an interesting character in himself. Isn't it? Well, it's all linked. Cause a lot of them are linked to the Bloomsbury Group. Come from again, it's like Laurel Canyon. The Bloomsbury Group was a group of writers, artists, and all these people that all became famous. Yeah, similar to Laurel Canyon. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and so that, that that's the end of episode four, Mockingbird. It's been quite a ride, is that? To be honest with you. Um, yeah. Near, nearly or just over three hours. I don't know what the clock's running at. Um, but, yeah. In episode five in the Huxley Brave New World series, uh, part two of this, Insight into George Orwell, we will be discussing Orwell's wives, Eileen O'Shaughnessy and Sonia Mary Brownell and a couple of other people as well uh, who was who were involved in his life. We're also going to go in a big way. These, these people who were involved, like... Eileen O'Shaughnessy and Sonia Brownell also were linked to security services. That's why they look like handlers to me or helpers or whatever you want to call it. Because if all, maybe they were watchers as in, you know, making sure he carries on 
the path that they wanted him to carry on uh, as a lifetime actor or whatever he I'm, was. I'm also, <clears throat> again, like I said earlier, also dubious of whether he even survived. When did yeah. when did he die? Was he forty two or something? He, he was some I can't remember, but it was nineteen fifty. It was nineteen fifty, right? And he, he he was in his late forties. I think he was about forty seven, right. forty eight, something like that. But you know when you talked about him having TB and getting shot in the throat, you do think did he die? And then they used his his persona character, and then just to, knocked his persona character off to bring out well, or, or, or he died. He actually legitimately died, and I'm just making this up because I don't know. And then they used this persona character to um, bring out uh, Animal Farm in um, 1984. It's a possibility, well, isn't it? It's, and it's and pretty, like we said before, there's no photos of him. No, very few photos. There's no recorded or film of him. Yeah. Um, to say work for the BBC, you, you, yeah. you would have expected there would have been recordings of him. I mean, and what a, what a brilliant way to make that <clears throat> have that character and make himself famous is that it doesn't exist. Mm. Much it's, easier to do in them days as well. Very, very, very much easier, and a lot of the pictures that we, that we see of him look not much. Again, maybe because he were ill, that the, he changed his face. Face changed. Um, You've got a guy who did all this stuff, right, and died in his forties, same age as me. Yeah. I've done a lot of stuff. Brendan as much stuff as him. No. <laughs> so, no. Went everywhere, fought in <laughs> numerous. Well, again, conflicts. It, when if, going into. The Indian Imperial Police or the Imperial Indian Police, whatever it was, that sort of goes against everything he stood for. He must have, if he stood for that the British Empire was an imperialistic, totalitarian organization. But, but wasn't that was early days though, wasn't it? When he joined the no, because he were talking about that when he were at Eton and stuff like that. Right. Uh, yeah. You know, he would like for the working man or uh, well, again, like you said, the middle class. Goes to Lower Eton, middle class. <laughs> goes to Eton, goes to Burma, then goes over to Spain. Travelling wasn't that easy in them days, I'm sure. No. It wasn't as easy no. as it was. Getting tickets and stuff like that. Right. <laughs> All right, you get a ticket, but I mean, but it's fun. Again, like like Uxley, they don't seem like, they're, they're not buying themselves super yachts and driving around in Rolls Royces, but yeah. they never seem to, to, they always live in big houses or are looked after by, so, they, they, you, you understand where they're coming well, from? It was they all old, old school, old money rich. I'm guessing that's what, yeah. that's what you're old bloodline, say. yeah. Um, old. Which then again comes back to what you said in uh, the early part of this episode that it reminds you of that uh, omen too when Damien's been told of his background and his role to playing world events. Yeah, yeah. You're now doing this. Yeah, you're, you're doing that. that. I don't this. want to do that. Well, you see that you... Adidas old all there in that bath. <laughs> yeah. We can wipe your fingerprints off it. Because that, that woman he met on that, that beach at Southwold where he was doing his uh, colouring in. But that sounds more um, like one of the colouring <laughs> That sounds like one of those Laurel Canyon stories to me. Yeah. You know, where they've just invented a romantic story. But he had he apparently had an affair with her. Her husband knew. And he still introduced him to a literary agent. Right. Yeah, you'd have punched him in the throat, wouldn't you? But, but, but that type of story goes on, and like uh, that Cyril Conley... His wife were the mistress of the king of Egypt, you know. Um, Maybe that's how these people work. Orwell had an open relationship with his his wives. Sonia Orwell were were quite a lot younger than him. They married after two months, and he signed all his work over to her. Yeah, didn't make sense, does it? Almost sounds like these are plans <clears throat> written out when they meet, like organized. Uh, sorry, he, organized. He, married, he married her on his deathbed. And he only survived two, two or three months after. And by marrying her, he he left her all his, all his uh, yeah, books and rights to his books. Shit, it? Thinks of shit. And she worked for. She sold his, the rights to his books to the CIA. Yeah, sounds like early days star whacking to me. Would, would he? Would if he were this totalitarian guy? Would he really want his? Books being sold to the CIA for him to use as propaganda if it hadn't been not. written for that in in the first yeah. place. Yeah, I would hope not. <laughs> it's weird how nobody can see that. Well, it's not weird, but you know they've got the Orwell Society, they've got the Orwell Foundation um, that talk about his work as some of this this fantastic work, but no one can say well it was used. No, but they probably don't talk about him. They just they talk about the Wikipedia version of him. And then just praise how brilliant 1984 and um, but, but even if you, even if you read the Wikipedia version of him, 
you have to question when it said that they sold the rights to all this stuff to the intelligence services. Right. Surely. I mean, well, it wasn't hidden. You know, it's not. And it's a. F- yeah, but the fact you're talking about everything, yeah, that's what we say about everything. Can, yeah. can nobody see this? <laughs> Does no one want to see this? Yeah, Does nobody, no one want yeah. to question this or look yeah. at this or, yeah. you know, even scratch your head for a second and go, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe that's something not something quite else. right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Nobody does. That's the trouble. Yeah. Where, where, where are the lunatics? <clears throat> where apparently. Are the lunatic asylum? Apparently. Yeah. Well, it turns out that Orwell has zeros and ones in his bloodline. Uh, as we're going to see next in episode five, we're on now after this one. Yeah. He is one of the living matrixes, yeah. or is persona or the Orwell operation is part of Orwell that. operation. I like that. Mm. Um, it's uh, yeah, but he's one of how many of these authors that are like that? Yeah, I mean, how many books has John LeCar sold or Carrie sold? Tom Clancy. All these people use pseudonyms. Spies use pseudonyms. Yeah. Actors use pseudonyms. Yeah. And when you think back to the old <clears throat> world of, I think Houdini was a secret agent, wasn't it? Because they used to use actors and performers like Houdini because he could move around the world with his tour in his magic show. But he was a secret agent. I'm not saying he was murdering people, but he could yeah. pass information on before the... It was different types. They're not, they're not all it men, are they? Yeah, not but then do you men. remember George Clooney made that film about that guy? Yeah. Um, like American or whatever it was called. Yeah. yeah. And he said yeah. he was. A, he came out and said he was a hitman, and they labelled him as a lunatic. Yeah. In that film, the the that George Clooney made apparently, they um, portrayed him as a hitman. Mm. You know, was it was that more plain truth? In well, of course, I mean Operation Gladio. These people just walk around in everyday civvies, don't they? Um, and yeah, the, the, that's that's who these people are. And you had that show. Did Matt Devlin do that one with Leonard about with Leonard, Leonard Cohen? Yeah, yeah. And weirdly enough, um, I was listening to. I don't. I don't really know anything about Leonard Cohen, but weirdly enough, I worked with a chef, and he's Polish, and he looks like Leonard Cohen. Right. right? And I said to him, "You look like Leonard Cohen," and he keeps saying, uh, "And not even by a coin." He keep when he does something right, he goes, "Hallelujah." <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Anyway, we ended up listening to a Leonard Cohen al- album because uh, we were talking about it. And he, the, those, whether he's a secret agent or not, he, there is words in his in his song songs about you know I'm on my own and, and I don't know. I was listening to, it, I was thinking, fucking hell. <laughs> and I was telling the Polish guy who looks like Leonard Cohen, and he's like, yeah, yeah, that's weird. I can't remember the lyrics now. He says the lyric in one of his songs, I'm all alone and surrounded by people or something. And just, I don't know, I was just thinking, my God, I think he was a secret agent. <laughs> yeah. Well, that lady didn't sound like she were uh, fibbing. I don't think she were making it up, was she? No. She was married to it, wasn't she? Yeah, she was. Um, but yeah. All right, then. well, we'll see you next time in episode five um, for this constant giving. Never ending. Huxley's Brave New <laughs> World Order. Um to be to be fair, I think this is my favourite research I've ever done. To be honest with you, because it is the stuff I'm interested in, um, not necessarily the character, just about the um, control, just lifting the curtain. Well, well also, curtain. you're you're opening a box that never existed for. Well, we'll see. Um, ne- ne- the next one is the exciting bit to me. Uh, right. That that is. A bit, a bit like Jim Morrison's, actually, although that's a lighter version of this, in my opinion. I think the most important part, maybe it's because it interests me more, uh, maybe other people might see something else as important. But Well, the bottom line is that um, 1984 and, and um, Animal Farm are given to us kids to read at school. Mm. So we should at least know fucking rights. And a, b- a bit what? of background of who they were surrounded by and who they are. Yeah, yeah. And why, why and the situation... Well, to me, it's like knowing the ingredients of the arm spears. You don't know ingredients of arm spears. Why would you have one? Why would you have one? Yeah. And this is the ingredients of 1984. And this is the ingredients of everyone's childhood. Yeah. Or part of it, one bit of it. Yeah. This is one bit of the operation in one, two books. Three books with Brave New World. The operation and... It's a light version because that's just a little novella. That you've been yeah. Given. <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Omen two, Damien. That always gets me. Anyway, yeah. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time.
Bye. Bye.